I thank you all for your patience. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 11, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag led by Faith and Cassidy Bowl from Catonsville Middle and Catonsville High Schools. I ask you then uh, to have a moment of silence, importantly, to remember the horrific attack on our beloved country 17 years ago today on 9-11-2001 when nearly 3,000 lives were lost. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is the agenda. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of our closed sessions and informational summaries can be found on our website at www.bcps.org backslash board backslash informational dot sum dash summaries dot html. Uh, selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a, re a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed on the box to my right. Ms. Adekoya will pull the names and Mr. Stewart will read the names. Our first name is Dr. Boschfron. Our second is Lily Rowe. <coughs> Our third is Diana Bergman. That is all. Very good. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer your comments or concerns to the superintendent. Um, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the system and is not a proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock and you'll know when your time is up because there'll be a beep. Uh, our, our advisory uh, and stakeholder groups are the first to speak. And the first is from the Baltimore County Student Council, the Superintendent Student, Student Advisory Council, Ruben Amaya. Mr. Amaya. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. As we move into a new and exciting school year, the student voice is becoming more important than ever. With many new initiatives being implemented in our county, the Baltimore County Student Council is working to ensure all students can have a say in the process. BCSC is currently working on revising our platform, which reflects what we as an organization stand for, with it to be, re with it to be released soon for student input. We are also working on many initiatives with the departments of curriculum, food and nutrition, transportation and school safety to ensure all students can be accommodated for and represented within BCPS. BC, BCSE also sw swore in its new executive board last Thursday. A huge thank you to Ms. White for assisting in the pinning. I'm excited to work with highly qualified, but most importantly, caring and loving students who want to make a difference for others. We are excited for the new school year and look forward to representing the 114,000 voices in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Our next speaker is a representative of TABCO and I invite Glenn Galante to come forward.
Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, uh, Superintendent White, and members of the board. I am Glenn Galante, the Executive Director of TAPCO, speaking for Mrs. Bainton tonight, who's enjoying her holiday. Whenever we think of this date, we are trans transported back in time 17 years. All of us alive at that time probably remember where we were when the towers collapsed, what we felt and how we have dealt with it ever since. Today is no different. The same feeling comes over us as we deal with our reaction to it. Personally, I lost a very close friend. He was a lieutenant in the New York City Fire Department and was killed in one of the towers. The world has fundamentally changed for us. We have lost some of our freedoms in order to keep the world around us safer. These changes have not been missed in the schoolhouses either. We have locked our doors, made it harder for people to visit our schools, and have begun to practice uh, many more types of drills. This is an understandable reaction. We are living in an angrier, more fearful, divided time. We are quick to blame any convenient target for anything we see as a danger to our way of life. We base so much of what we believe on sources that are less than truthful. It has become almost impossible to tell the reality from the fiction. Some of the fake news has some partial truth, which makes it hard to find the real facts. Spin has always been with us, but it has become so skewed, it feeds the narrative and we become even more divided. Education is the answer. We must teach our students how to discern truth from fiction, how to listen carefully and where to look for the real facts. We as a society need to start listening to each other without a jaundiced eye that insists we are right and you are wrong. Until that is a reality, we will keep practicing drills and locking doors and holding other people at arm's length because we are afraid. The drills we are holding in our schools are necessary and unfortunately will be so for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Central Area Advisory Council is Amy Freeman. Ms. Freeman. Good evening, board members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. The Central Area Education Advisory Council is excited about this upcoming school year. We value our role in Team BCPS to serve as both informed advisors to the Board of Education and as liaisons to the communities we represent. One of our goals for this year is to increase our community outreach efforts so that we ensure we are capturing the voices of as many of our community members as possible. I am a bit disappointed that the Area Education Advisory Councils were not included in the planning discussions for changing the zones for schools as it does impact us. For the time being, Area Education Advisory Councils are sticking to the prior five geographic area designations for identifying our area schools as is outlined in Policy 1230 um, and not the new East, Central, and West zones. We also look forward to the upcoming community meetings on high school capacity study and seeing the revised proposals for providing enough seats for growing enrollment. Because there is no current plan in place, it is hard to provide substantive feedback on the proposed state capital budget that is on tonight's agenda. I do, however, um, question that Pine Grove Middle, which is at 72% capacity, is on the list for a renovation and addition in addition to an entire new middle school being added to the Northeast area when there are other areas of the county that have middle schools that are overcrowded, such as Ridgely Middle at 111% um, percent capacity that we've been um, asking for relief for several years from the Central Area Education Advisory Council. In the Southwest, there's Catonsville Middle um, at 113% capacity, and they are nowhere on the list. Um, we also have a beautiful renovation that was recently completed at Dumbarton Middle um, without any seats being added. Dumbarton Middle is also over capacity. So I'm having a hard time making sense of the current plans. Obviously, I'm missing some key information and would appreciate some clarification on that. Lastly, we're hearing a, a lot about transportation issues throughout the county. There are serious concerns about overcrowded buses and students sitting on the floors of buses or standing up because they do not have a seat on the bus. It goes without saying that this is a major safety issue that needs to be addressed immediately. When it comes to budget priorities for BCPS, we need to do everything we can to make sure that every seat 
every student has a seat in their school, a seat on their bus, that their schools and environments are safe and conducive to learning, that they have heat, air, conditional, air conditioning, potable drinking water, food, et cetera, that they have that all the students have access to the resources they truly need to thrive and succeed throughout the school year. Good timing, thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Farone. Dr. Farone. Good evening to all. Evening. Last month, I presented to you the first amendment of the United States Constitution separating government from religion. Today, I would like to echo to you that this past board, not you, the past board, have made mistakes for the past 23 plus years, closing on minority religion holidays for political reason. Not a big deal. Supreme Court made mistakes in the past. It's human to err. So example of that, that the Supreme Court made mistake in what's called Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, where they claimed that separate did not really violate the Equal Protection Clause in our Constitution. And you know what happened then and after. But later on, the Supreme Court really realized that error and corrected it and talked about the integration, desegregation with deliberate speed. And then later on, the Supreme Court realized that things are not really being done quick enough and they said, the time for mere deliberate speed has run out. So last year, when the religious holidays on the calendar was in front of you, one senator came in, asked for that minority religion holiday to be closure. One director of a political religious organization came in and asked for the same. And one TAPCO official asked for the same. That was enough for you. And if you remember, thousands of petitions and Muslims came in in the past almost 15, 20 years, including when Romaine Williams was the chair of PRC, filled all this room in the holidays. So, if it is illegal to discriminate against color, it's also illegal to discriminate against religion. I really ask you this year to take precedence from the Supreme Court. It is a human to err, but to make the same mistake every year, every year, is wrong. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lily Rowe. Ms. Rowe? Hi, so I spent the last day or so reading through the special education presentation that you're getting today, and I wanted to comment on that. Because 68 pages is a lot to read to find that the information you're looking for isn't in the 68 pages. Um, I think that it's very good to understand what we're spending on something and what the projected spending is going to be, but I don't think that that's very helpful when I didn't find how many children are in the home and hospital program who are special education students who could not succeed in their zone school. I didn't find how many special education students do we have in the system according to the different areas of special education instruction, or there's not even a total number. And so to say that all of the goals and the uh, things that are outlined in these 68 pages, including the cut and paste of the Komar handbook, which took up 
you know, 30 pages. The, it's, it's very weak on actual data to actually decide how much, is how much money we're spending, is it meeting the need? Because I hear stories all the time about schools who don't have enough staff to meet the needs of the special education students in those schools. I hear stories about students going into crisis because they don't have one-to-ones or whatever, and then they end up being restrained, sometimes losing development, and then ending up in home and hospital program. And I'd like to actually see data on are we meeting the needs of our special education community and more recent data than the 2014 audit because that's ages ago compared to some of the changes that have been made in special education and continue to be made and we don't have any data on if any of those changes are even effective. So I see a lot of stories, individual stories from individual parents all over the place from people who advocate for parents in special education, but I don't see any data available from the school system or anywhere else that talks about our special education population and is the money we're spending enough? Um, are we staffed enough? What, what is the staffing ratio for special education students if you have the point of a special education is they have an IEP, which is Individualized Education Program. So like my son just needed speech therapy a few times a week. Another child needs someone walking around with them constantly who, and behavioral interventionists and speech interventionists and all kinds of different things. And I just don't think that the right kind of information was in this report. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. Um, so on July 24th, I took a trip down to Baltimore City and I testified as a parent from Baltimore County to the Maryland State Department of Education. My number one concern was regarding rules and policies um, in Baltimore County that I did not feel were being um, implemented with consistency. So as I'm going and looking through stuff and looking at the new website and where policies are being applied and the rules are being applied, I came upon something that I actually needed to find that I couldn't find, which is the home and hospital policy and rules, how that department actually functions. I was able to Google and find that policy back in 2008 it was 6600R, it's been revised. I don't know exactly what happened to it, but it's very important. And this is why it gets very important. Because I believe that there are certain departments that have come out from the special education umbrella that were there before, like the Department of Assistant Technology, and it was moved to um, the STAT program a couple school years ago. Now I'm watching the home and hospital department also move from under that umbrella outside to the, what's it called, the Innis, um, integrated learning, okay? So what's going on here is that these are two departments that need to be attached under that special education umbrella, and it's very important. But we also have the new climate department. Now we have a climate department, which is great, but home and hospital, it, there's no connection of communication there under our climate department. And that is a severe concern. I want to make sure the board members understand. When we're looking at home and hospital, children that qualify for home and hospital is based on a doctor's recommendation, a licensed medical provider for either a physical medical condition as preventing the child to access their education in the general education environment or an emotional condition. Key emotional. We're talking about our children with high anxiety, severe depression, and some of our students that are, are high risk for suicide in Baltimore County. And they're not under the proper umbrella that would better meet their needs if they were linked out to other departments that they used to be grouped with. 
because yes, it might sound great to sit there and put an online curriculum access for the child because he might get more education hours. But the reality is that child is emotionally unavailable to access and open that, that laptop. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Stay right there, please, um, because next on our agenda is uh, public comment on uh, board policies, our second reader, and the first one is policy 7240, new construction designing school site selection acquisition, and Ms. Bergman, you signed up to speak on that. Yes, I did. So for new construction, we are looking throughout Baltimore County to create these new learning environment to meet capacity so all these children could have access to education and a brand new 21st century learning. Well, some of these children are also our special education students. Our special education students, there are some of them that it takes a parent multiple school years to access something called a sensory room. I'm seeing new construction and I'm not seeing no sensory rooms coming in. What's a sensory room? Well, a sensory room provides great benefits for an OT in our public school system to help a student that needs OT needs. It also helps with those sensor motor skills that that child might be struggling with, whether it's fine motor or gross motors. Our physical therapists, there's a few that are contracted through BCPS, and they need an appropriate learning environment so they could have their needs met for our special education students. So I see these great spaces working for all, but I think our special education students should have that part of learning environment that I don't see in the policy defined. I see things defined like the furniture part that's coded in there and other areas there, but I don't see our special education needs and we have an achievement gap that we have to close in Baltimore County schools with our special education students. Thank you. Thank you. Again, don't leave uh, because you've also signed up for the next uh, policy, but Lily Rowe has signed up for this policy as well. So on seven, um, 7240 uh, school site selection. Okay, so this may be something the superintendent would do anyway. I suppose it does depend on who the superintendent is. But I do think it would be important in this policy to have the board express that they value the input of the public when selecting new construction sites. And under the standard section of this policy, I don't see anything that directs the superintendent to do anything in regards of getting feedback from the public or, I mean, the way this reads, it kind of sounds like you could just, the superintendent could go meet up with the county executive, they could select a site and there could be bulldozers on the site before the public has a chance to say, no, we don't want that there. And Sometimes you have to put things places people don't want. I understand that. But I would like to see like somewhere in this A, B, C, another thing that says that there has to be some level of public involvement. I like how we do our public involvement where um, boundary changes are concerned. And I do like how we're doing the public involvement with the high school capacity study. But I think the location of schools is really important and there should be something in here about public input. Thank you. Uh, the next policy that is on the agenda for comment tonight is policy 7310, new construction financing design and construction costs. Ms. Bergman and then Ms. Rowe. Okay, so in continuous of what I was talking about, new construction, also our renovation projects. Okay, um, even our re renovation projects in some of our schools, we're not taking into consideration our Title I students, where we want to build this community-based um, environment and we don't have like a pantry room or an area of the building to serve to store either food goods or even clothing. Um, for some of our families in need in our Title I schools, our farm families, um, these are things that when I'm looking at the gap for certain families, these parts and this information is missing. <coughs> <coughs> 
excuse me, from being included in these building designs. And I really wish there was an opportunity before we start putting the pieces together for that public input. Because uh, for my community, if I know we need additional seats, we also need additional um, spaces that are very important in my community, whether it's going to be a food pantry or a lending closet, or if we're going to provide um, a more efficient um, nurse suite. Um, for our students. So those are things that don't usually get discussed this early in the process, but a community needs those supports and needs when we're looking at renovation and construction to drive and move forward. Thanks. Ms. Rowe. So this, this policy looks like to me that it relates mostly in the financing of new schools, but I feel like if we're going to make important decisions about whether to build a new school and spend the money versus renovate it, this policy should have something that requires the school system to evaluate what it would cost in the feasibility of building a new school versus renovating the school compared to the school's expected life cycle and whether or not it makes sense to build a new school or renovate a school given that, and given that a lot of these schools were trying to put central AC in, they were built for radiators. And air doesn't move the same way water moves through pipes. So now what do we have some schools where the rooms are really hot and other rooms are really cold? Because maybe it wasn't the right thing to try to retrofit an old building with modern technology. So I think that we need that comparison, and we need to not just look at it by site by site in an ad hoc kind of way one year at a time, we need to have a 10-year facilities plan that is a rolling plan where we've audited all the schools in the system, we've compared it to projections, but also I think that the, the condition of the facilities where minimum safety standards like air quality, water quality, overcrowding, these things are just as important as overcrowding. In some cases, overcrowding can be mitigated with trailers and the school itself is in such bad condition that the students and teachers pray to end up in the trailer. And there's, no, there's AC in the trailer and no AC in the school. I, it's appalling if our school condition gets to be so bad that they want to be in the trailer. And so the other thing that I think that we need to think about as far as new construction and renovation financing is, why are we in this position where we have all of these old buildings that suddenly need replacement is because we haven't maintained them properly. According to the state, we don't have a very good maintenance record for our schools. And in fact, a brand new school already doesn't have a great maintenance record. So I see no reason why, since we have maintenance money that gets allocated, that these schools aren't being maintained. There's something in the disconnect. And I'd like to see um, a work order system, much like the county does code enforcement, where any student or any teacher or anyone in the community who sees something wrong with the school can input that in the same way they do code enforcement complaints. And that the school system, when they have work orders, so that anyone can check that system <coughs> and see the status of a repair on a school report repairs that need to be done, see if the request for the repair was approved or denied or why. And if we had that, I think it would go a long way for adding. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item F, the superintendent's report. Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to start tonight by acknowledging what is weighing, weighing on um, many of our hearts. 17 years ago, our country endured the loss of nearly 3,000 lives, including first responders who bravely ran toward the danger. So on this anniversary of September 11th, we remember and honor those who were taken from us, those who were injured, as well as their loved ones. And just like most Americans, I, I clearly remember that day. I was a principal who served in a school where there were several mil military families represented. And although there was a natural fear associated with the unknown for everyone involved, I'll never forget the resolve of my school community or the resolve and the bravery and the resources or the resourcefulness of the military personnel who were also part of our uh, school community as well. We lifted each other and we supported one another and for that I will forever be grateful. That same resolve helped help keep us strong during uh, Hurricane Isabel. 
I think by the time it hit, it was Tropical Storm Isabel, but uh, devastating nevertheless. Many of you will recall that we were hit pretty hard in Baltimore County, particularly in Bowley's quarters. Um, but again, the resolve of the Seneca community at that time served as a, a beacon of light that was needed during that difficult time. Um, because many times our schools do serve as the hub of the community. So our politics didn't matter. Our personal agendas didn't matter when they were set aside, uh, all for the greater good of the community. So instead of tearing each other down to say who should have done what and when, we chose to support each other by caring for our family's basic needs. We offered help and assistance, and we, we offered um, a shoulder for our families to, to lean on. I'm hoping that tragedies like 9-11 and as well as Hurricane Isabel, I hope those tragedies are behind us. But one thing I've learned in leadership is that we are more productive when we demonstrate kindness as well as the values that we teach and want to instill in our children. And I'm hoping that we can carry these lessons forward. Um, as for the pending hurricane, we are issuing guidance to our principals and to our staff on ways to in which to, to prepare just in case um, Hurricane Florence comes our way. So for all of the principals who are listening again and for our athletic directors, I know that we have some games that are scheduled this coming weekend and you've, you should have already heard from um, our athletic department to see how we can have those games even sooner rather than later. I know that our transportation department, for instance, we're moving moving our buses to higher ground, all of that pre-planning and forth, um, that forethought goes into it. And I just want to um, thank the staff for thinking ahead to prepare. Again, we, ex we expect the best and we prepare for the worst so that we can make sure that we um, have a school system that is operating well and functioning well and that we're able to support our communities in the meantime. So while this time of year will always be somber for our country, it does coincide with a very happy season, and that is the start of school. So I want to extend a warm welcome back to our 10-month staff as well as to our students and families. It is wonderful to have our classrooms once again bursting with energy and enthusiasm and most of all learning, which I had the pleasure of observing firsthand last week. I want to thank our Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller for joining me on school visits both, both the first day, which was last Tuesday, as well as on the second first day uh, for some of our schools, which was last Friday. I also appreciate the encouragement for our students and staff from members of the board and elected officials who visited schools during our first week. I'm excited this school year to continue our focus on literacy and climate, as well as student safety. One new support I want you to know about is the How We Teach and Learn section of the BCPS website, which helps parents and the community understand our commitment to graduate, graduating every student, not only with a diploma, but also with a resume. This website also shares our expectations for modern learning and our supports for families. And you can reach the How We Teach and Learn um, uh, site from the bcps.org, the academic focus section is there, just click on that. We're also celebrating a successful start to the school year for our amazing team in the Office of Transportation. And I know that many times we, we have some ups and downs when it comes to transportation, but it's important to keep in mind that we have eight to 900 buses on the road every single day. We transport about 80,000 students twice a day, every single day. So not only have we received fewer calls about transportation issues than in previous years, uh, particularly since last year, we have 30% fewer calls than we had this time last year. And so we we have some issues that we still need to resolve. We are not diminishing the, the need for to, to still look into some of the issues that need to be resolved. And we know that the issues that are out there are real. But we also want to take a time to celebrate our transportation staff for all of their hard work that they have put into making our system more efficient and, and effective as well. As you know, safety is our number one priority. We want to, um, of course, highlight the academics and student achievement, but we have to wrap all of those uh, supports in, into our our school climate and making sure that we have a warm, welcoming, and safe environment. Last week, we released our first 
Comprehensive Safety Plan, which is quite an accomplishment for a school system, particularly of our size, which explains how we create and maintain safe and secure teaching and learning environments. There are eight volumes in the plan. The first three volumes are available online to provide an overview of our practices, our student supports, and our minimum expectations for staffing, equipment, and procedures. The remaining volumes of the plan contain sensitive information and are available only to staff. To review the first three volumes, again, go to vcps.org and you would click on the safety focus area. So finally, tonight's video gives us a peek at how we welcomed students back to school. So thanks again to BCPS TV. And we can show that video at this time. Good morning. morning. Welcome, Welcome back. back. I'm really excited to see my best friend at my new school at Honeygill Elementary. I'm really, really excited. <laughs> it's my last first day of high school. Okay. Enjoy the first day. First year teacher, brand new school, new year and new beginnings. I'm excited for this school year. We have a beautiful new school building. We have amazing children coming to us, and it's going to be a great year at Honeygill Elementary School. First of all, she's been very excited. State of art facility. I just want her to grow, learn, and have a good time. That's my only expectations. Your folder. Everybody's going to get a folder. It's a good school. Both of the schools are great, but this is top notch uh, to be top dogs, and you know, you know, to be the you know first grade graduating from Victory Villa is amazing. So far, my first day, my first year is going great. Um, the kids are all ready and excited, and I think it's going to be a great year. Hang up your book bag on the book. Estudiante, estudiante. Oh, students, no, students. Excellent. Muy bien. I'm excited for my new school, my friends. I'm looking forward to having a great school year. I'm so excited to be here with you today. We're so excited about this very first day of school. This is an exciting time for our teachers, our parents, and for our community members as, and our students as well. This is their time for us to get off on the right foot. And we start to see some of the beginnings of literacy instruction. We're starting to see the emphasis on school climate. Many of our teachers are already building relationships with their students, and they're building relationships with each other. So which group would like to share first? Wishing everyone a safe and healthy school year. It's going to be a great school year. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's my report. Thank you, uh, Mrs. White. That the report and the video were top notch. <laughs> next, next on, on our uh, agenda is the chair's report. I want to start by welcoming everyone to the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, for our almost 115,000 students, this month begins another step in their progress to college and career readiness. Uh, this fall is also the last semester for many of the members of this school board. Uh, the election in, on November 6 will result in identifying seven elected members, and a commission will identify others from whom the governor will appoint four um, other members, and our student member, Miss. Atacoya will, of course, continue to serve. Uh, there are many opportunities between now and November for this board to address matters which will benefit our 115,000 students and the future of Baltimore County. Our superintendent will continue to, to direct an excellent team of administrators, teachers, and support staff who all need the encouragement of all of us and to whom we all owe much. Importantly, I've had uh, much discussion in recent weeks with County Executive Don Moeller about a position authorized by former County Executive Kevin Kamenetz and now funded in this fiscal year. I'm pleased to report that a new position funded by the county will be an auditor position who will work in concert with BCPS but who will report solely uh, to this board. Uh, the auditor will serve as this board's eyes and ears as part of our contract review and approval process. 
Um, a job description will soon be posted and we should look forward to our dedicated contract auditor uh, within the coming weeks. For this, I know I and the board are grateful to County Executive Moeller and to the County Council. Uh, it's my hope that in the future, the school board will be a more effective body uh, with this ad important addition to our team. Next on our agenda is our student board member, Ms. Adekoya. Good evening, everyone. I am Halima Adekoya, student member of the Board of Education for Baltimore County. I would first like to say amazing job to the Delaney High School Chamber Choir and the Kenwood Air Force JROTC at BCPS Night at the Yard. You guys were awesome. Congratulations, students. We made it through our first week of school. I hope everyone's transition into this school year is going smoothly. On the first day, I had the opportunity to participate in school visits. I visited Hollabird Middle School where I explored classrooms that emphasized and reminded students that they were number one and they mattered. I also met beautiful students eager to learn and have an amazing school year from Grace to Maria to Josue. Despite the fact that we had inclement weather days that closed 10 centers in schools, Team BCPS still showed up and showed out. We had a fantastic second first day, and I am also delighted to know that there are plans in place for the implementing of ACs into these facilities. On the second first day, I had the opportunity to visit Willon High School and Bedford Elementary School. Students, I loved every bit of the visits, particularly seeing all of your lovely faces. I met Kevin from Willon High School, who is avid, loves reading and history just like I do, and the beautiful students at Bedford, especially the Bedford fifth grade class of 2019, who welcomed me with open arms. In the past week, Baltimore County Student Council also hosted its swearing-in ceremony led by both President Ruben Amaya and Superintendent Valletta White. It was an amazing ceremony. I am very proud of all the students working day in and out as student representatives that were newly sworn in. Congratulations to you all. Again, I love each and every student and I promise to continue to represent you all. Never hesitate to contact me through email, Twitter, or Instagram. Let us continue to try and put our best foot forward in all that we do as individuals and as a team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our agenda, item I, personnel matters. We invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, termination, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented in exhibits I-1 through I-5? Uh, do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, that is uh, affirmed unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next on our agenda is administrative appointments, and I ask Mrs. White to present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal, Lansdowne High School, Executive Director of School Support, Office of the Community Superintendent, People Personnel Worker, Office of School Climate, Specialist, English, Office of English Language Arts. Supervisors, School Social Work Services, Office of School Climate. Supervisor, Visual Arts, Office of CTE and Fine Arts. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments presented in Exhibit J1? So moved. Second? Second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Again, unanimous. Thank you. Ms. White, you're back on. Thank you. I offer congratulations to the following individuals. I'd ask that as I call your name, you please stand along with your friends and family so that we can recognize and celebrate you. First, we have Kara Bowl, who will be a new per pupil personnel worker in the Office of School Climate. <laughs> Kara, do you have anyone here with you this evening? She has the pledge people. Wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations and great job on the pledge. Thank you. <laughs> 
Next, we'd like to recognize Paula Davis, who will be a supervisor in School Social Work Services Office, Office of School Climate. <laughs> Paula, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Yes, my son, James Davis. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we'd like to recognize Nihal Gudasera, who will be the new assistant principal at Lansdowne High School. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? And your new principal. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Next, I'd like to recognize Sharonda Gregory, who will be the new executive director of school uh, support in the office of the community superintendent. <laughs> Congratulations, Sharonda. Who do you have here with you tonight? Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Nicole Jensen, who will be the new specialist in the Elementary Office of English Language Arts. <laughs> Nicole, anyone here with you this evening? I'm here for that. <laughs> Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Ryan Twenty, who will be the new Supervisor, Visual Arts, Office of CTE and Fine Arts. <laughs> Ryan, anyone here with you this evening? I do not. Uh, they have their own back to school. Well, <laughs> and we're also your family, so congratulations. <laughs> and congratulations to all. Mr. Chair, that is my... Thank you. Next on our agenda is uh, item K, uh, consideration of action taken in closed session. So with that, I ask Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. And as is normal for this, <laughs> we're going to give you a second to let the of room clear. You're on. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered four appeals regarding confidential student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. All four matters were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral arguments. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters, which were hearing examiner numbers 18-54, 18-58, 18 18-62, and 19-03. We'll do them one at a time. Is there a motion to uh, confirm the uh, action taken in closed session on 18 54. So moved. Uh, second. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, and Mr. Virch recuses himself. Next is 1858. Is there a motion to confirm the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one recusal, two, two recusals. Next is 18 62. Is there a motion to approve the action taken in closed section? So moved. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And one recusal by Mr. Virch. And last is 19 03. Is there a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Second? second? Discussion? All in favor, again, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Mr. Virch recuses himself. Thank, Thank you. you, and as usual, the orders are on the table for a signature. Thank you. Next on our agenda is contracts. And for that, I invite Mr. Stewart to take the lead. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, members of the board, earlier this evening, the Building and Contracts Committee met to discuss items L1 through L13. We, as a group, were able to recommend to you for your full approval items L2 and L5 through 13. We pulled out from consideration for the full board items L3 and 4, 
and I have an update as to uh, item L1, which is that Ms. Hen has shared with me that she has, to get it correctly, um, uh, given the, that the advertised discount does not apply beyond year one, she is withdrawing uh, her concerns as to contract pricing for L1. Okay, let's start with um, uh, contract items L2 and L5 through 13. Is there a motion to approve those items? Could, could we, I have some questions on some, on two to six. Could we pull those out? Okay. So we'll have, a, how about a motion on seven through 13, L7 Move. through L13, there's Move. a motion. There's no need for a second. Any discussion on those? All in favor of approving contracts L7 through L13, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, that's 10, that's unanimous, so seven through 13 pass. Next is L1, is there a motion to approve contract L1? So moved. Is there uh, no need for a second? Mrs. Hen, do you want to discuss that? All right. Is there anyone else that has any comments on L1? Mrs. Causey. If um, Mr. Sayers could explain the pricing scenario, which was questionable in, which was questioned in the Building and Contracts Committee. Yes. So uh, the the pricing. Um, that is included uh, on the website that was referenced is based on a 25% discount. And then over and above that discount uh, over the next three years, uh, BCPS will receive an additional 43% in year one, uh, an additional th uh, 30, excuse me, uh, 40, Yeah, 43% in year one, 33% in year two, and 22% in year three. So it's, it ends up being 68%, 58%, and 47% in total for each of the, in each of those three years. And our uh, calculated total cost for the, th for the three years, $497,000. Any other questions or comments on L1? Thank you for that. All in favor of L1, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And Mrs. Causey? No. One no, nine, yes, it's approved. Next is L2. Um, is there a motion to approve L2? So moved. It, and is there a discussion on L2? Mrs. Miller, then Mrs. Causey. I just had a question. It references in the summary a student data privacy. Thanks. Thank you. It references in the summary that a student data privacy evaluation was performed. Can the board get some detail on that and the outcome? Um, I'll have to ask uh, Mr. Imbriali if he has any details of that. Uh, I know that incorporated in the contract is compliance with our policy. No, for the augmentative devices. Okay. This is for the augmentative uh, this devices. This is L2, mm -hmm. which is JBO 730-18. So, so there's not a data, so there's not a data privacy concern, but the, perform the performance evaluation was performed on the contract that is expiring on September 30th. Is that, is that the question? Uh, I don't know, because it says a student well, data privacy evaluation. Error. If that's not correct, that may just be an error. So the student, da the student data privacy, st the student data privacy document is included in the RFP. So as part of the RFP package, so the company who has been awarded this had to sign the student data privacy agreement as part of the RFP process. Okay. And it's included in the RFP and they will sign it at time of contract. Okay, so that's all that that is referring to. Yes, I think th it appears the, there's maybe an extra the, word in there, but it's the student data privacy agreement was part of the RFP and 
the company who won the award is required to sign the data privacy agreement. Okay, and then you said there was also a performance evaluation done on the prior contract? Yes, there was. And, and can you share some results on that? They, they performed satisfactorily. Satisfactorily, like, yes. like, can you, is there a range? There, there were no, there were no concerns with the, with the prior vendor who happens to also be the existing vendor through this RFP process. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that it was helpful um, as I reviewed the, uh, or I attended the curriculum committee meeting where the, this um, contract was discussed and also the need for it for some of our um, uh, special needs children that have a real. Um, impairment in, around speech so that it's very helpful. And I'm glad to see that we are in, in increasing the amount that we're able to provide for these students. So, and, uh, and it was helpful to hear the CCAC support it. So thank you. Further discussion? All in favor of L2, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to nothing. It's approved. Next is L3. Is there a motion to approve contract L3? Approved. Discussion. Mrs. Miller. Um, what, now, th this uh, program was piloted, is that correct? Yes. And was the board given any results from that pilot? And when, when did that pilot conclude? Ms. Good Shea. evening. Hi. Um, yes, we presented to the curriculum committee multiple times on this project as we've rolled it out from pre-K to kindergarten and then expanded to first grade. Okay, so the full board was not given results of the pilot. So earlier today, um, we did discuss it. I can certainly share that data with you now if you would like. <laughs> well, really the curriculum committee should be sharing those kinds of things with the full board. Um, you know, it would be nice in advance so we can think about these kinds of things. Um, so we have no results from that pilot, essentially. I, I mean, We I, do have results from the pilot. I mean, the, the full board does not, so. I'm not sure I understand the question other than we presented the results of the pilot to the curriculum committee each time we brought this contract. We also did bring, this contract has been expanded once before, you might recall, and we did bring the results of that the first time to the full board at the last time we asked for a modification for the contract to increase the spending at the, for the new contract, the first time we brought the contract. Um, this is a huge expansion. How much of the funding is coming from MSDE grants? All of the funding that's outlined in the spending authority is grant funding. The reason that it says operating budget and grant is because some schools do choose to use some of their operating budget funds to provide PD to their faculty. What is the reason that they would do that? Because they find this program to be incredibly valuable for their teachers and their students. But I mean, why would they use their own budgets instead of grants? Because if they're not a Title I school, that's the only funding source that they have available. Okay, so if they're not. Title I, okay. Um, okay, and just a comment, it is, I, I'm concerned, and this really applies to conscious discipline and the restorative practices. Um, I, I'm concerned that both of those programs are being used as an alternative to traditional types of discipline, uh, the way that, that they're um, being implemented in the schools. So I, I have a, a a lot of concerns around uh, both of those contracts. May I clarify then? Sure. This is not used as an alternative to consequences. This is used as a program to teach children the first time. We're using the definition of discipline coming from the root about pupil. We're actually teaching children how to behave and how to emotionally self-regulate so that we can then hold them accountable when they make choices that are contrary to the rules expected of them. So this is a proactive measure. This is not in replacement for students receiving consequences when they violate the student behavior handbook. Well, I appreciate that. I think maybe that's the intent from the central office. It is. But it's not what I'm hearing, um, but from 
people Just a in point the field. of clarification. These programs, in terms of the um, conscious discipline and restorative practices, are wildly popular in our schools um, and are sought after by many of our principals um, because they're teaching students about um, how to behave, how to, con how to resolve their conflicts. If you'll recall, part of the, the safety plan has to do with how we manage behavior in Baltimore County. So that has three parts. It has prevention, restoration, and logical consequences. Prevention has to do with effective instruction, and that's the best way to deter problematic behaviors. Rest restoration has to do with conflict resolution, and we need to teach children how to behave. That's something that this board has asked us to do, to do something. This is in an effort, this contract and the next, to do something. And so, again, that's why when we pilot this something, we have found, and our principals have found it, to be very, very effective. And certainly, there are logical consequences. Our data does not suggest that we have done anything otherwise. Our suspension data, as a matter of fact, is, has increased. So this is not in lieu of. It is not a substitute for. It is a part of the entire comprehensive package when it comes to student behavior and discipline. I appreciate that. I, I, and I've heard that several times from the central office, but um, from teachers in the system. Very good. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. Virch. Thank you. Um, Ms. Shea, I just wanted to point out we did have a bit of discussion about this in the Building and Contracts Committee. So just to be clear, that when we're talking about the MSDE grants yes. that are for our Title I schools. These are not additional grants um, for this particular program. These are grants that the schools have traditionally received. So, no, is actually, that the case? no. What we discussed earlier was that the, the Title, Title IV, IV grant is an additional grant, and that would be the funds that for the central rollout in purchasing the materials for the classrooms as we roll this out to grade level. So that is additional funds that are targeted specifically about supporting climate and positive behavior supports for schools. What we asked for was additional spending authority because schools have requested to be able to use their Title I funds that are existing, that do fluctuate um, as we identify Title I schools, to be able to purchase additional professional development for their staffs at their choosing as it relates to their climate goals on their SPP and to the other work that they're doing. Thank you for that. Can yep. you identify what amount of this expansion is from new Title IV funding? Sure. So um, currently in each Title IV, um, it's an annual allocation. So this um, probably over the lifespan of it would be close to um, 600,000, between six and 700,000 total. Um, when we were calculating the spending authority, we identified that we would need about $600,000 over the life of the three years for materials and the initial PD. The additional $1.8 million was us just projecting what schools might potentially use Title I funds for, um, for their professional learning. And so we were trying to identify a spending authority that would allow schools that flexibility should it meet their needs. So what we're talking about is expansion from previous contract spending authority of $275,000 to modification amount of 2,384,000. So with 6 to 600 to 700,000 coming from the new title 4, that's still the schools reallocating um 1,700,000 um roughly if they chose. So uh, again, we had schools come to us to ask us for that. The PD costs, if a Title I school were to choose to want to identify this, and again, we are providing this at the request. This has become something that schools are asking for, and schools often ask central office staff to help make recommendations. So we've done the research and we've done the training to support this. The spending authority is to allow the potential for Title I schools, should they choose to use the funds that they have in support of their climate goals on their SPP. What we estimated was $12,000 per year for a Title I school. That would cover the cost of doing a two-day training. That would also cover the cost of doing potential coaching days where they could hire a coach to come and work with their teachers in the classroom providing that job embedded support that um, if 50 to 60 of our schools chose that option each year over the next three years, that's where we estimated the spending authority. But it certainly could fall short of that. We just wanted to give principals the option, should they choose at their request, to use those funds that way. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Ed? There you go. Thanks, Ed. 
Um, Executive Director Shea, thank you for coming this sure. evening. Thank you for coming and uh, so knowledgeable me. about this. Uh, conscious discipline, this is something that we're really, and you've heard the word repeated, it is an expansion. It's a significant expansion, isn't that correct? Yes. And it's not just a significant expansion, the expansion of an opportunity for our teachers. This is also an expansion of the opportunity for those additional human resource uh, folks that we have, like uh, I want to say like our peri-educators. Yes, sir. And perhaps our school counselors. Isn't that also right? Yeah, that is absolutely right. And the more that we expand that and that becomes the, the way of doing um, uh, conscious discipline in our system, then it becomes something that our students at each grade level as they progress through elementary school that becomes part of their expectations for their behavior. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. And after years of repetitive expectations through elementary school, then in some ways this, this equips our children with conflict resolution tools because they're in an environment that evidences this and promotes it on a daily basis in each of their grade levels. Is that right? That is correct. Now, if we didn't expand this, it would just be whatever they might have received, whatever might have been available uh, early on, perhaps, in their educational career. That is correct. We currently mm -hmm. have second grade students who learned this in kindergarten and first grade that now would be in second grade with teachers that were not prepared to support them without materials or training. So the students would know it, but they would not have an environment to support that. And that expansion then will go from second through till fifth. The third, fourth, and fifth, exactly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And just to be clear, this uh, uh, contract is for three years, so your expected annual cost is about 600000 you said? That's just for the materials and the PD. That spending authority would not include Title I schools using their own funds for school-based PD. Very good. Any further questions on contract L3? All in favor, please. Oh, Mrs. Causey has another question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, dovetail on some things that were talked about earlier. We have heard from our community, from parents, from teachers, from students that have come to us and talked about the need for improving the climate, including the discipline. So while I am concerned that the full board didn't receive um, a report and the suspension data that Ms. White talked about, I, we have seen a little bit of that, but one of the concerns that I have is we have increasing suspension, as she stated, but is that per capita because we also have increasing enrollment. So what does that actually mean? And how was that broken out amongst um, different uh, student populations? So with that in mind, in that our communities are asking us to do something, to help. Um, and where I have made the motion and the board is going to bring to the PRC, the system is going to bring to the PRC discipline policies, and we're going to start talking about that, and we're looking forward to getting information from Ms. White, from the work groups that she's assembled, and also from the um, uh, community input uh, group that Ms. Hen uh, led the board to vote for. So with all that in mind, I would like to uh, amend this contract and just include one year of funding so that then we could receive at the board, the full board, a more robust report in April about the success of the pilot. It just seems like a tremendous expansion and um, I, I, that's, that's, for those reasons, that's what I would like to do. I'd like to make a motion to amend it, this contract to be approved with one year of spending authority. Right. Is there a second to that second. motion? Second. All right. Any discussion on that? Mr. Stewart. I'll be quick, but I would say that reducing this to a year sort of ignores the fact that we have been using this and testing this and seeing its effects. And I think we have a hard time sharing with our community that we are committed to taking big steps as it relates to promoting a better climate and culture and dealing with discipline issues in our schools if we don't take big steps such as this. So I don't think that this is the right time to reel it on back. And a contract, a contract that's a, um, approved for three years could be terminated after one year if you decided against per continued performance, correct? Of course. Correct. So you could approve it for three, and if you didn't like it after one, you could terminate it. Is that correct? Yes. All righty. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we could, of course, terminate. However, by limiting it to one year, it forces this board to consider the effects and the results. We are hearing the opposite from our community. We are hearing that this is not effective, that it's being used um, as a substitute for consequences, and teachers are asking us to act. They are asking us to do something, and this is not what they're asking us to do. We need more community feedback. We need data. We need to see results. This full, full board needs a presentation 
um, this spring about the results of this, I will support Ms. Causey's motion to limit this to one year and ask that we receive that information so that we can make an informed decision before we commit to such a significant investment of taxpayer dollars. Okay, all in favor of the motion to amend to uh, Ms. Adequoya? For clarification purposes and understanding, this has been in, um, this has been rolled out for how many years? Um, three grade levels over a period of two and a half years. And there, I was at the curriculum meeting and I saw the data. If there's a way, then that can get presented. Because I believe this is an amazing program. I loved it when it was presented at the curriculum meeting. So I see no reason to hold it back and to limit its capability and capacity. But if there can be a pre that presentation can be shown to the whole board to nullify any any um, problems or scared viewpoints, can that be done? If that was the directive, sure. This is white. Again, so typically presentations are given to the curriculum committee so that we can um, look at the the value, the curricular value of of any type of um, program. So that is the purpose. And again, all board members are invited and. In, uh, to attend the curriculum committee so that they can get that kind of curricular value. Value. We don't typically bring the full presentation to the full board because, again, we have several presentations. We can certainly get that information to the board, the same information that was presented to the curriculum committee, if the board chooses to um, hold these until the next meeting. Mr. Virch. I would just like to ask our curriculum uh, committee member, um, was this a presentation that, uh, I mean, from the sounds of it, you were, that you were in fact impressed, impressed by? Yes, I was very impressed with the fact that students who are in second grade now are getting that foundational bring up of conscious discipline and how to solve conflicts that will follow them until they graduate or until it's a life basis is a life skill so I believe it's something that should be impacted and should be implemented into all students and continued and was that a did you have a sense that that was a pretty full and complete presentation to the curriculum committee yes because there was data involved I got gotcha. you <laughs> long term data and um, and and that data that that data was very impressive from what from what you've said and you were present for the entire committee for the curriculum committee meeting is that right yes I was and then and and what you heard was the same thing that Miss Causey heard because she attended that same committee meeting is that right I believe so, yes. Oh, very good. Well, thank you ever so much. No problem. Dr. McComas. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Gillis. I just want to remind everyone that the curriculum committee is, is uh, recorded and streamed and available for viewing for the public as well as committee members. Thank you. Okay. Any further comment on the motion to amend? Mrs. Miller. Um, I, I do think that there is value in these programs um, in certain, on certain level. Um, particularly when we're talking about, um, you know, social interaction type issues and, and for the younger grades and whatnot. But when it comes to more serious um, behavioral infractions, uh, when, when the board has asked for um, solutions to serious discipline issues, what we get every time is a presentation on restorative practices or um, when um, Ms. Hen had made a motion for uh, public input on discipline, what we got was presentations on restorative practices. So I do believe that this is being used as um, an alternative to traditional discipline. Mr. Young. Ms. Shea and Dr. McComas feel that this is working, that principals are asking for it. You're saying that teachers are seeing something different. So my question is, are you reaching out to Ms. Shea and Dr. McComas telling them where you're hearing these concerns, that way they can work to address them? Yeah, we've talked about it numerous times. It's uh, countywide. Have, but 
have you given them specific examples that says, I've been to this school, the teachers here are saying this is not working, so that they can go in and examine where the perceived failure is? I'm not going to put staff in the schools on, on, um, at risk for any kind of retribution, and it doesn't matter because it's system-wide. But this program is not system-wide yet. Am I correct, Ms. Shea? Correct. So if there are certain schools that are having problems or having more problems, if there is a disconnect between the administration and the staff, that's something that needs to be worked on and corrected. Otherwise, yes, we're giving a false sense in one direction or the other. Well, I appreciate that point. Um, but again, when we ask for solutions to serious discipline problems, what we're being presented with is the answer is restorative practices. So this is being used as a substitute. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I just, I can't let that point go <laughs> um, because that's just absolutely false. Um, we, again, in, when it comes to logical consequences, that's just a natural part of, of discipline. So again, you not only do you have principals who work very hard to hold parent conferences, making sure that if their suspension is in order, that those suspensions do happen. We have superintendents designees who appoint students to alternative centers even, if they need to be removed from their schools. <coughs> and so if you check our numbers, our numbers speak for themselves. And if you actually go to the alternative schools, you'll see children there. Because the, we do have to separate separate kids sometimes when they are a harm to themselves or to others we do have to separate them uh, so that we don't have a moratorium on suspensions our data bears that out so what you're saying is wrong and it is absolutely false um, I am not saying that we don't have some behavior issues in some of our cases in some of our schools we're working with that we're working with our principals to make sure that we're addressing that I have said to principals on multiple occasions that if you need to separate a, a student from the school environment Environment, that we act absolutely support you. And I've gone on record. I believe that Ms. Causey was in attendance at the last leadership development session where she can attest to the fact that I said that to uh, all of the administrators there. So again, what you're saying is absolutely false. We do have logical consequences for our students, and many times they suffer those consequences, and they do so uh, throughout the system. So again, restorative practices as well as conscious discipline. This is, again, on the other side, the proactive side to teach children how to behave, to teach children how to resolve conflicts on their own, and to teach children what we expect in our schools. We do not expect to send our children to school to be hit, to be kicked, to be beaten, to be afraid. We want our students to be able to learn how to behave themselves. And just like as good parents at home, we teach them how to behave, and then sometimes we put them in time out. And so that's what happens in school as well. We teach effective um, behavior, and we teach what good behavior looks like. And then there are times when the line has been crossed that we do have to separate them from the school environment, and we do so. Mrs. Eaton. Well, Ms. White said much of what I was going to say, but um, I did visit Norwood Elementary School on several occasions where they do use restorative practice, and I've heard nothing but praise from the teachers, from the students, and from the principal. It is a teaching mechanism, it's not a punishing mechanism. They wanna teach the students the right way to act so that they don't make the mistakes. But they do have things in place for students who do make mistakes. This is not for students who make the mistakes. This is to teach them not to make the mistakes. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should go down to Norwood Elementary and sit on one of their sessions. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I think it's great to have lively discussion um, and to hear all points of view. I would say in the curriculum committee meeting, we spent uh, 15, 20 minutes hearing about the, this issue, um, which is not as much as it merits, I believe, given what we have heard uh, from our community here at the board. So this is not who's just talking to Ms. Miller or who's just talking to Ms. Eaton or which school Mr. Stewart goes to. We've heard it here at the board, parents with their students sometimes coming and saying that they do not feel that discipline and consequences are happening adequately in their schools. So 
Ms. White, to say that what Ann Miller is saying is false, I think is, is an overstatement and not appropriate because we have all heard right there parents and students coming and saying that discipline and consequences are not being sufficient. And that's their experience and we can't deny that. All of that being said, I do believe that this merits another year of using it in our system, but I would also point out the number of schools that have been using it is small, and we are talking about a wide expansion. And it will be important to understand how that is working with a full report to the board, say in April, after one year. And very easily, we can keep progress moving forward. This is not delaying progress. This is saying we're going to monitor that progress before we continue a million and a million dollar expansion. That's what we're saying. Just remember, this has only been piloted at the lower grade levels, kindergarten one and two. Is that what you said? Correct. But in every school. It's not a small yeah. number of schools. It is right. every elementary school. And, and again, I think the also. testimony that we've heard mm -hmm. during our meetings has been from older children, not kindergarten first and second. And just to, uh, to correct the record again, with Ms. Miller's um, point that is false and inaccurate, where she said restorative practices and conscious discipline replace logical consequences or replace discipline, that's wrong. And that is false. And so I hold to that. That is absolutely false. Now, keep in mind that I held 10 listening and learning tours. And at this board also held a discipline hearing, and we partnered with the advisory councils to hold five discipline hearings. It is because of those hearings, in terms of hearing from parents and teachers and community members, that I created the division of school climate and safety. And so that is the reason why we have a more intensive focus to bring together not only the physical safety of students, but the social emotional aspect. And so it is, it, it is curious to me that when members of this board, particularly those who are so uh, adamant about us pursuing our um, efforts to listen and be responsive to the community on doing something, not just on the physical safety side, but on the social emotional side, would then deny us the opportunity to do so or would restrict our efforts to be able to have any continuity by limiting, limiting us to one year. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, June had talked about Norwood uh, in her district, which of course has been one of the schools that uh, for years has pioneered restorative practices. Um, on my first day, I went to five schools, including um, my original elementary school, Hawthorne Elementary School. The excellent principal there, um, Dewan Pinamonte, took me through um, school, through the school, uh, into classrooms where I actually had been a student, and one of the, um, one of the classrooms we stopped at and spent some time in. Um, I'm here to tell you, the kids were sitting on the little carpet, and they were in their circle, and the teacher, and it was a, um, it was a first grade class, and the teacher was having children verbalize what respectful behavior in the first grade classroom setting is. And there's the back and forth between the kids. So if you're not able to make it to Norwood because your GPS may not work in Middle River, Maryland, on Kingston Road, where I went to elementary school, there's a there's a hundred faculty and staff at that elementary school. One of 16 Title I schools in the 2017-2018 school year that were using restorative practices and were using them when I was there um, on, on uh, the first day of school. So I encourage you to come by our Hawthorne Elementary School. Uh, and, and I would point out to our air conditioning team, the air conditioning was working, <laughs> although they had to replace, uh, do some work uh, in, a, in, a, in a room or so. Uh, but be that as it may, um, there's a lot of very good things happening in these Title I schools. And I would point out in that list from 2017 2018 a half a dozen of those schools are in my district in our sixth district I have to believe there are folks there who are going to the you know going to the lengths to improve climate in their schools and see restorative practices as one of the ways to help achieve that goal okay the Thank motion you. is to amend the contract to restrict it from to reduce it from three years to one year all in favor of that motion to amend please raise your hand the motion fails, it only has four votes. Now, I'll entertain a motion to postpone this so we can have a full presentation consistent with Ms. Adekoya's suggestion. So is moved. There, is there a second on that? Second. Discussion on that? Mrs. Miller. 
I think we could go ahead and have the vote tonight and get it on the record. Okay, any further discussion? All right, all in favor of the motion to postpone to a, uh, the next meeting or a, um, a meeting thereafter, please raise your hand. One, two, three. To motion postponed. Postponed what I said. Yes. 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 So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. That motion fails as well. Okay, the motion is on L3. All in favor of L3. Well, hold on. Uh, let's make sure that we do uh, okay. do a roll call here because I want to make very clear to our community who supports school discipline measures and who doesn't. Roll call on the motion to postpone or, or on, the, on the motion. No, on no, on, on this. Okay. The motion L is being considered. All right, we'll do the, the full motion on L3. Please do a roll call. No, yes. Yes. Sorry. Ms. Causey? I will vote for one year. So is that a no? That's a no. Ms. Yes. Mr. Hayes? I fully support school discipline. Yes or no? And Mr. Stewart uh, trying to flip this around. So yes or no. Sort of an abomination. Right. So, got it. so it's not a speaking vote. It's just a vote yes or no. I understand that, Mr. All right. Chairman. All right. So yes or no. Abstain? Yes? No? I'll go um, with... I'll go with... I'll make you wait. I'm going to vote no. Okay. Ms. Penn? No. No. Mr. Stewart? Emphatically, yes. Mr. I'm sorry. Mr. Birch? Here and I. <laughs> Mr. Young? Yes. Yes. The motion fails for lack of seven. All right, next is L4. Chair, is there I would like to bring forward this contract for one year. We already had that vote. Well, I doing don't again. know that every board member would understand how that would result. Now that we have that result, I would like to still do as right, I recommended, that we bring forward this contract for one year. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Of Mrs. Eaton. If, it, if we don't vote for it, approve it now, can we put it back on? Sure. Next, next sure, it can come back anytime. It can come back. All right, uh, it's, there's a mo there's a motion and there was a second, right? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Miller seconded. Any further discussion? Yep. I'll, oops. Uh, for the discussion, sure. I look forward to supporting this contract as it stands in the future. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hayden. From um, the point of view of the impact on the children, what would be the impact if we approved one year and then re-upped it um, April. Does the staff have an answer to that? Yeah, what I would say, Mr. Hayden, is what we're doing is we're telling schools that perhaps you can take it to third grade, perhaps you can, but you might not be able to extend it beyond there. What we do is we're leaving schools in the lurch with, un, with lack of clarity. Are they going to be able to roll this all the way out? I think schools would only be in a lurch if they haven't been listening and communicated with about what's going on. If they knew they were waiting for an answer of a real affirmative uh, report back and how the system worked, I doubt there would be any lurch or concern at all, but rather they'd be moving forward. I think lots of people sell our schools and our administrators in the schools short. I don't. Mrs. Hen. I agree with Mr. Hayden's comments. If the results are as positive as staff claim they are, and I, I believe they could be, I want to see that. And there's no doubt that this board would approve a continuance should you come back in April and say, you know, show us the results and that there's oh, positive as communicated. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do also uh, concur with Mr. Hayden that we uh, shouldn't sell our, our schools and our administrators short. If they uh, feel that they are really benefiting from this program, then they will certainly be part of the positive report that you bring to us in April. And I would also just go back to uh, a public comment that we had from our 
Central Area Advisory Council where they were left out completely from the discussion of a very uh, comprehensive reorganization. And so I would like to make sure that in that report is the information from our uh, area advisories and also from the parent stakeholder with real surveys or something specific to this, specific to the success, spe specific to the opinions, because th that was not in the report that I heard. And I'm very concerned when we hear from our advisory councils that they are left out of major decisions. So again, we're not going to delay anything. We can do one year. Let it be known now. We're going to move forward with this, and we're going to have a comprehensive evaluation presented to the board in April and then we can move forward again if in fact the results as you go up year by year are significant and helpful and warrant the investment of those title one funds that will be shifted from something else that they're doing now so which we don't know what that is um so i would suggest that the board vote now for one year and we can move forward mr young and then mr stewart if i'm interpreting dr mccomas's statement correctly um, basically, if we go for one year, then schools may, may or may not sign on to this program. So we're, we're then limiting our pool to even look at a um, complete set of schools that, that could benefit from this program. If we are truly concerned about how it is doing, we can still vote for a three-year program three-year contract and if in April as you want if there is not any um, significant improvement then the contract can be canceled then mr. Stewart uh, I think we know how this is gonna, I think we know how this is going to turn out but I would just say that I have every confidence that those who wanted more information about this program are going to be reviewing the video of the curriculum committee no doubt about it Ms. Adekoya. I just wanted to emphasize the word teamwork. Um, earlier, Mr. Young referenced the fact that Mrs. Miller, Mrs. Miller, if you heard and if you have heard and if you've been told about the effects and the impact, and it's apparently not impactful, it's not most effective, why not go to Mrs. Shea and let her know about what you're hearing so that there can be that collaboration for better. You can let her know and she will go back with her team to think about, okay, we're hearing that this is not effective. Where can we make a change? We are a team regardless if we like it or not. We need to be able to collaborate and say, this is where we're falling short. This is how we should be able to pick each other up. If, there, if you are hearing that consistent, oh, this isn't working, this isn't working, why not go to her and let her know? And why not put your best foot forward to say, let's work together on, together on this? Okay, That's the it. motion is to approve L3 for one year. All in favor of approving L3 for one year? Yeah, I'm sorry. Since I was addressed directly, I just want to respond. And I appreciate that. I mean, we've been talking ad nauseum about it since, um, I would say, early last year, you know, with the discipline issues. So. It has been brought brought forward many, many times. Okay, all in favor of L3, please. All in favor of the motion to approve L3 for one year. I, I'm you sorry. You can't vote, Mr. Sanders. I know. Um, <laughs> I just want to clarify that the contract itself doesn't ex expires in Jan in end of January. So the one year would be from today's date and what... I really need is a spending authority to go with that. So we're going to go with the motion that's made. Um, all in favor of L3 being um, a one-year contract, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. The contract fails for lack of a, um, a majority. All right. Um, next is contract L4. Is there a motion to approve L4? So moved. Is there a second? Oh, and no need for a second. Is there discussion? L4, is there discussion? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I would just quickly say that for the exact same reasons that we've discussed, um, in order to make sure that we have more stakeholder input, that we have 
more um, of a report to the full board that we approve this contract with one year of uh, spending authority. Is that a motion to change this from a three year to one year? Yes. Is there a second on that motion to amend? Second. Any discussion on the motion to amend? All in favor of the motion to amend, please raise your hand. Uh, motion fails for lack of a majority with four votes. Um, now, the motion is L4. Is there further discussion on it? All in favor of L4, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. The motion fails for lack of a majority. Mr. Chair, please note that I'm abstaining for it's lack of four information. Four to three to one. Next contract is L5. Is there a motion to approve L5? So moved. Discussion. Mrs. Miller, you wanted discussion on L5, I believe. I, I just had a couple questions. Um, again, there was the reference to a student data privacy evaluation was performed. And also, could I, I, I just want to understand whether this is for MAP or are we adding a new assessment? This is for Matt. Okay. Any further discussion on L5? This so, is so, But to my question. I thought Mr. Sayers answered your question. The student data privacy evaluation, is that the same as the other answer? Yes. I believe okay. so, yes. All right. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Gossett. Mm -hmm. I did have an additional question about the um, how we're going to utilize MAP. Uh, right now we do it uh, fall and winter, is that correct? And is, moving forward, are we going to do fall and winter? So to answer that question, <clears throat> um, that's partially correct. For grades three through eight, we do fall and winter because we have the Maryland assessment in the spring. For grades kindergarten, um, one and two, we test in the spring. Kindergarten has a winter to spring assessment. First grade and second grade has fall, winter, and spring. Okay, and is that information available in the, where is that information available, Ms. White? Or? All of our data, you be, as far as dashboards and things such as that. We have data available through our student counts report. Yeah, it's we also have available in the uh, annual testing calendar, uh, specifies the testing windows. Okay, but the results for our younger folks that Well, we uh, tend to report out the winter scores for our younger folks, and that's been part of the stat evaluation each year that comes uh, to the board. And it's also in the dashboards that are made publicly uh, to the board each year. Um, tend not to put the spring data there, uh, again, because we use the uh, park data in the spring for grades three through eight. So for K through two, we take the spring test, we have the children take the spring test, but we don't report those results. It's used within school dashboards uh, as part of the school planning cycle. Okay, I think that would be helpful to, for the board to see. So can we have that in a report for the board so it would come out in the summertime? is receiving a report on student achievement at your next meeting. Okay, great, thanks. All right, any further discussion on L5? All in favor of L5, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, unanimous. All right, and the last contract is L6. Is there a motion to accept L6? So moved. Discussion. Mrs. Miller? Um, can you break out the various classifications? It references selected students. Um, so about what percentage are the homeless students and uh, the special needs and then the, um, the percentage for the drug testing of BCPS employees? Um, is there anyone here with any additional data yeah the information that was presented at the work session was at approximately 45 total students uh, I, th I think the biggest subset was about 18 special ed students um, but we'll have to get you additional details okay so it's 45 total 18 are special ed so I assume the balance then is the homeless there are a large number of homeless in that number. I just don't have a total or a, a subtotal or a percentage. And about how many for employees? 
Uh, I have no data on that. It's a relatively small number. And um, how much of this increase then goes towards contracted busing services, or how much None. is in-house? None. That's contract in the traditional sense of a yellow school bus is not uh, related to this uh, presentation. It's We have separate uh, contracts for athletic transportation and field trips. We have a separate contract for regular student transportation. And then we have uh, this contract for these very specialized students and or situations. So you're saying it's not a traditional school bus that's Correct. doing the transporting? Correct. And are they BCPS owned? No, these vehicles? are uh, minivans, taxi cabs, and other similar vehicles. Okay. Any Thank further? You. Any further questions on L6, Mr. Virch? Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, George, thank you. I didn't get a chance to um, um, thank you during during the meeting. You've been going on and answering a lot of questions for folks. Um, mention is made in the uh, in the analysis that comes with this about the McKinney Vento. Um, legislation at the federal level and in the presentation or in the analysis that's given to us it references additional requirements as a result of that federal act is that right yes and what if you could just very briefly highlight for the for our our most interested board members what are those in, in, in additional requirements or heightened requirements so that if a student is living with a relative uh, in another jurisdiction, perhaps Prince George's County or Cecil County, and they wish to remain in their, what was their home school in their prior uh, domicile, then they're entitled to be transferred here, transported here, sometimes at great expense. And if I may just uh, point out, this is with regard to homeless students. Correct. And that that federal act actually provides a definition for homeless. Yes. Because otherwise, they, you wouldn't be able to say who they're, they're referring to. And when there is a student that may be, that may have been, say, in one of our schools, and they're, they're in the school, but the family's homeless, and, home, and the family moves, say, to another jurisdiction, um, because of that um, uh, tr transitory nature, McKinney Vento makes certain assumptions that, in fact, that the, the transitory nature of that experience may actually be harmful to the child in their educational experience. Yes. Whereas remaining in a school with the stability, with the friends, with the adults, with the support services that may be there at that school to wrap loving arms around that child, that child may then have this like anchor in his or her life at a particularly vulnerable time for him, her, or their family. Is that right? Yes. And that's when you say these, that's why I use the term difficult to access locations, because these would literally be off of the typical Baltimore County public school bus route. Is that right? Yes, and there are also act there are also geographic circumstances in some cases where a school bus can't get down a particular road or lane, and and some of of these uh, services are provided in those cases. But primarily, it's special education and homeless students that are served. And the two jurisdictions, for example, where the student may have been with us, one jurisdiction, one district. But the homeless family has now relocated to another jurisdiction. The two jurisdictions under McKinney Vento, they actually, those two jurisdictions, their folks can talk and work out a cost sharing arrangement for those transportation costs. Isn't that also right? Yes. Now, McKinney Vento has a default. If the two districts can't work it out, then they split the cost. Right. Um, uh, board members will have to vote their conscience as they think is best. In our sixth district, we have homeless families, and I don't think homelessness is something that's unique to our sixth district. I'll be voting for this contract. Thank you, George. Importantly, in, in line with the questions that Mr. Virch and you were dis asking and discussing, McKinney Vent Vento uh, comes with a mandate, but with no money, right? Correct. All right. 
Okay, further discussion on contract L6. Mrs. Miller. Um, how about shared domicile? Does this cover that, or are they classified in with the homeless? Uh, well, shared domicile can be a different situation other than homeless. I, I don't know, I can't make a connection in all situations for that. Further, okay, further discussion. They, yeah, I, I'm still. Um, and do we have, uh, and I thank Mr. Virch for some of his comments there, does BCPS have any arrangements with other school systems to share costs? Yes, we, we share our students uh, who, who attend school in other jurisdictions and those jurisdictions who send their children here and, and uh, we, we have financial arrangements and at the end of every year we settle up with all of the LEAs in the state. So we have arrangements that we've agreed, we've all agreed to with every jurisdiction where this exists? Yes. It's, okay. it's prescribed in state law, so they're not individual MOUs. It's, it's a, an MSDE managed process. Okay. And okay. Could, would it be possible for the board to get um, the breakdowns then that I had requested, like, like system-wide? On the wide, composition not just, of the students it, Not served just here. on the, exp the um, expansion or, or on this contract, but from transportation, um, how, you know, what is the breakdown of um, incidences where we're supplying this type of um, special transportation and by, by the various groups? So we, how much are, you know, special ed, how much are the homeless, you know? So some breakdowns on those numbers. We would be would happy be to possible? supply that information should that be the will of the full board. All right, let's, uh, let's. Does that uh, need to be the will of the full board or can we just get the information? Let's, uh, are, you, are you talking to Mr. Saris? You were looking at Mr. Saris, I didn't know. Well, I guess I'll, I'll ask Ms. White. I mean, is there a so reason? So I, I think generally board? the the board's policy has been when we're asking the staff to do additional work, we make it a board decision, not an individual decision. So that's that's the policy the board has been operating by. So no, no I would disagree with that. We've been asking. As a matter of fact, today we've uh, asked for additional information, and they'll say yes. As a matter of fact, when, when Mr. Something Smith said yes when I asked for it originally, so I'm just asking, can transportation provide us with And uh, I do a feel the responsibility based on past practice as well. Again, with when, when we're talking about multiple individual requests, we're also talking about uh, an inordinate amount of uh, staff time. And so I want to make sure that in doing so, that we're providing the board the information that they that you request and that you desire, but again, that it is um, the will of the full board so that we can do so in a comprehensive manner. So let's do that in two steps. Let's first vote on L6, and then we'll vote on the request of Mrs. Miller to additional, for additional information. All in favor of contract L6, please raise your hand. It passes 10 to nothing. Now, Mrs. Miller has a request for information from transportation about the number of persons who are homeless versus the number of persons who are, I suppose, at a driveway where the bus doesn't get down versus uh, any other of the options that uh, we all discussed during this. Is that your request? It's a detailed report. Is there a, a second to Mrs. Miller's motion? Second. Any discussion on it? Mrs. Eaton. And what are you going to do with this information? Well, it can guide the board in making decisions. As a matter of fact, you know, we've been asking, I know uh, Ms. Hen and I think Ms. Causey have been asking for um, transportation uh, agenda item for a couple of meetings now. And we know because we've had public input that transportation is a big issue, especially at the beginning of the school year. So having um, information around this would be helpful in making decisions. But what does that have to do with how many homeless kids take the bus or need special transportation? What does it have, what does what have to do with it? You said we have a lot of transportation issues. Mm -hmm. What does knowing how many homeless kids we have on buses or, or private transportation how is that going to help us solve our issues? 
Well, it depends on what questions and issues arise in front of us, but here it is in front of us. We don't often get an opportunity to ask for data. So while it's in front of us, I'm going to ask for the data. Then we'll have it when we need it. Okay, all in favor of Mrs. Miller's motion, please. Oh, Mr. Hayden. Uh, I'd just like to talk about past practice, uh, past practice of which I've had a, some. Uh, board members asked questions and superintendents answered questions. It didn't have to be a group of board members or all of the board members directing. It was always a collegial atmosphere where a question could be asked. Nor did we have superintendents who always said, well, it's a burden, it's an un, uh, unmanageable amount of time we have to put in these things. And I just really like us to reflect on that as we move forward. Why are these things all of a sudden unmanageable when board members want to ask individual questions when in the past it was practice? Okay, all in favor of Mrs. Miller's motion, please raise your hand. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, opposed. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, the motion fails for a lack of majority. Next on the agenda is item M, consideration of the privately funded capital project request for interior digital signage at Owings Mills High School. Ms. Byers. Good evening, Chair Gillis, Mr. Stewart, wherever you are. <laughs> Superintendent White, tonight I'm bringing forward for approval privately funded capital project to upgrade and expand digital signage throughout the building at Owings Mills High School. Uh, this project is being funded by a 2017 score with Intel Core Award, which was won by the staff of the Best Buy in Owings Mills. Staff of the Best Buy had an opportunity to select a local school to which the prize would be donated, and they selected Owings Mills High School. The amount of the award is $10,000. The total cost of this project is $11,307. And the school is going to um, assume the cost to be on the $10,000. In accordance with policy in Rule 7330, uh, this request has progressed through all the proper channels for approval. Do I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project request at Owings Mills High School? Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The motion carries nine to nothing. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Byers. Next on the agenda is item N, and that is third reader of uh, policy review committee matters, and I ask Mr. Virch to take the floor. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of our board, our Board of Education's policy review committee asks that our board accept this report of our committee's recommendation to amend the following policies. Board policy 3111, budget planning and preparation. Board policy 3113, transfers and supplements. Board policy 3121, funds management and classification of expenditures. And board policy 5200, promotion and retention. The proposed amended policies are presented to all of us on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit N. Is there um, I would just oh. hasten to add, uh, notwithstanding the opportunity for public comment, um, no public comments were made on these policies. Is there a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. Mr. Uh, Chair, could we break these out individually? Sure. 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 Is there a motion to accept uh, the board, the, the PRC's recommendation on policy 3111. So moved. All right, discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to point out as a member of the Policy Review Committee, when this came up for discussion, there was uh, questions that I had asked around the board and its responsibility for approving the budget, but also in taking part in the planning of it. And in the policy, if the rest of the board will note under paragraph two standards, 
where it uh, talks about in planning the funds to be included in the budget request, the superintendent shall identify the budget initiatives by considering input from the community, area ed education advisory councils, staff, and other stakeholder groups that the board is not even mentioned. So I think what's important for this board to consider is that we go back to what many other um, local boards do, and it may be all, I didn't look through all of them, uh, but certainly many of them do, which is to have a board's budget committee that works year long alongside of the community area education advisory council stakeholder groups and also the superintendent staff uh, would support that committee for the board. Um, because in that way, it would be more of a proactive approach for the board to be involved, just as we are involved in policy review committee, just as we are involved in building and contracts, uh, just as we are involved in the curriculum committee. So I would um, suggest to the board that I, after there's full discussion, I'm going to be offering an amendment to add a board committee as one of the standards. All right. Any further discussion on board policy 3111? Mrs. Miller. Yes, um, there actually was input, um, I think, during just regular public in input period um, regarding um, these policies. Um, and one of the suggestions that was made and has been um, discussed by Ms. Causey as well is a need for a 10-year facilities plan modeled off of what they do in Anne Arundel County. Um, so. Um, I would actually like to um, amend the motion to move that we add a requirement in the policy to develop and follow a 10-year facilities plan modeled off of the one used by Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Yeah, okay, so that's your desire is to put that in, in policy 3111? Yes. All right, is there a second? Second. Discussion. I, I think we've had um, a lot of input regarding this, and um, we have every year we go through the budget and talk about how our prioritization is lacking. Um, and this would really help us to have to identify our facility needs based on need uh, and not have it fluctuating every year, reinventing the wheel. So uh, we know that we need a long-term plan like this, and, um, and Ms. Causey has spoken before about um, the particular plan that Anne Arundel County has, and so uh, I think that this is a good step for us to start with policy to create that requirement, and then we can begin to work on getting that developed. Mr. Stewart. So I personally don't believe that this belongs in a policy, let alone this policy. I will be offering a motion later tonight when we get to the capital budget as to that item. Further discussion? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Causey, then, then Mr. Virch. I'll yield to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out that one of the issues around a 10-year capital plan it, that Anne Arundel uh, has done is that it includes all of the stakeholders and also the key funding partners, which is the county executive, the county council, the board, the superintendent, and also community. So that all five of those key groups are working together to identify not only the capital construction needs, but also identifying how much is going to facilities to manage it. And all of the needs of the community are recognized, prioritized, to uh, agreed upon criteria, and then everyone knows where they are. They know that their need is identified, that they're on a list, and that as funding becomes available through all the sources that we have, and many new sources that may become available, um, then those needs are addressed. So it doesn't become what we've had to endure recently, where communities feel that they have to advocate for themselves louder or better than other communities instead of every community knowing that they're on a list and that their needs are recognized. Also, when we're talking about, as uh, was mentioned by our stakeholder from Central Area, um, where we have some things on the list 
that seem that they're ahead of other uh, communities. We have Pine Grove Middle School, which is under capacity, which is getting an addition, and it was pointed out that Ridgely Middle School and um, Dumbarton are overcrowded, but don't have a solution. So they, you know, there's a disconnect between an involved community member and understanding how the needs are prioritized, and that at, that we understand there's needs all around the county, and we want to make decisions for the whole system with complete knowledge and with the community's understanding that we're trying to do it in the best order possible to improve the learning environments for the most students as soon as we can in a cost-effective way. So I would support that. Ms. Adekoya, then Mr. Birch. What is the purpose of adding the 10-year amendment to the policy? Well, this is the budget planning and preparation policy. So it lays out how the board is going to proceed, what our, um, what our requirements are. And so this would be the right place for us to say we have to have a 10-year plan as part of this process. Uh, Mr. Virch, and then there's lots of hands. <laughs> Mrs. Hand, Mr. Stewart, Superintendent. I would note that um, off-road vehicles take their title because you're able to go off-road with that properly designed vehicle. The overarching issue, which has been conveniently, I think, not discussed, and it's a structural issue, is that while this is the Board of Education, the General Assembly, which created the Board of Education did not provide, unlike jurisdictions in other states, the General Assembly, for its reasons, and it's had numerous opportunities to amend, has chosen not to provide a Board of Education with revenue generating authority. Rather, those in elected positions in the legislature uh, whether in Annapolis or locally in Towson, they make those decisions. So, using this vehicle to tell folks in the state capitol or just down the road in the county seat how the folks who elected them to make decisions, how they should make those decisions because we've amended a board policy that is not going to be what drives, ultimately, a 10-year facilities plan. It will be a structural change if the two legislative bodies decide to do that, or in the alternative, if those bodies who are elected and are powered to fund, spend tax money, decide that that is the scheme that they wish to pursue. Scheme, of course, in the positive sense. To in here say, this is where there will be a committee, and the board could certainly do that, but to amend this vehicle to create that is to pretend as though there is an, another policy, and that's policy formulation, which is before the PRC right now. To the extent folks want to take this vehicle and go off-road, well, then one can make the argument there's no need then to have a policy committee, a policy formulation policy, because you're just going to wing it wherever a certain topic word arises. And in this vehicle, that topic word is capital budgets. I note secondly, in his remarks earlier tonight, our board chair said, and I was pleased to hear, that an idea I had, that I had moved more than once, and which our board had supported more than once, the creation of a, an analyst for our board, in fact, has found favor with county government. County government is now funding that position which will now make available to the board going forward an added resource for 
analyzing, understanding, reviewing, operating, and capital budgets in a very organized way as opposed to the Subaru commercial where they just turn off the paved road and go down a dirt road. So I think what's before us is merely a policy that has been amended to reflect editing conventions. So if in fact this policy doesn't pass tonight, things will continue as they are. Secondly, if one drops a new board committee here, well, then that then says the policy formulation policy isn't really a place to have committees either. It's far less organized. It's whichever you want to do. I'm okay with either one. I just don't think that tonight's the night to pretend that the Board of Education can dictate to either the General Assembly in Annapolis or to our own county council and county executive just down the road in Towson about how they should make decisions about spending taxpayer dollars, the dollars of our own students' families. And, and that's my position on it. Thanks. Mrs. Hen and then Superintendent White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, to respond to my colleague, Mr. Virch, any decision this board makes is subject to the good graces of our um, funding partners in county and state government. That is not a reason for inaction. Um, secondly, to Ms. Adekoya made an excellent point earlier this evening in that this board needs to act as a team. We need to get on the same page and capital, fund, capital projects are one of our most important responsibilities. By getting on the same page with a 10-year plan that we all agree to and can guide us in our decision, um, removes the, the pitting of, each, of communities against one another, removes many of the struggles that we're currently faced with. It's not only the smart thing to do, it's a positive move for this board to get on the right page. It belongs in policy. We're the ones to get it done. Um, it certainly belongs here. Again, not to say that these decisions can't be changed by our county and state funding partners. They certainly can be, but that is not a, a reason for this board to continue to be inactive. We need to add it to this policy. Superintendent White and then Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for the, the board's uh, consideration, keep in mind that, uh, again, this administration has been open to the idea of a 10-year uh, capital plan as it um, would increase transparency and also prioritization um, of our projects. And so we're very open to that. The question is whether or not that language belongs in policy. And I say that because there are multiple long uh, multi-year plans that we have in the system. So in terms of governance um, and the role of governance with when it comes to the operation, operating in capital budgets, we have a long-term and a multi-year curriculum management plan. We have a multi-year facility and maintenance plan. We have a, so now we're talking about a multi-year 10-year capital plan. We have a multi-year magnet plan. So there are multiple plans that are related to operating in capital budgets. And my fear is that if we limit that um, this policy language to only one, then we could be um, ov just overlooking some of the other plans. I believe that policy language should be broader so that it's all encompassing of the various plans that exist in the school system. And we can take look at uh, the 10-year capital plan outside of this policy language. Mr. Stewart and then Mrs. Miller. Um, I'll just dovetail very quickly uh, on that, which is I do think we hamstring ourselves if we throw this into a policy, a half-page policy, uh, not understanding or acknowledging that there needs to be uh, a certain amount of discretion and flexibility that's not afforded um, when we put things in policies, and that it should be aligned with um, or take, the, take a place alongside our other long-term plans as well. Mrs. Miller. Which Thank is what you. I'll be offering. Um. Just to respond to some of the other comments, um, a facilities plan identifies the needs and priorities of the system. It doesn't dictate funding to our funding partners. Uh, that's a whole separate process. Um, and and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what was discussed by Mr. Virch about a board committee. That wasn't mentioned in this motion. Um, 
And to Ms. White's uh, um, points, I'm very glad that she supports the idea of a 10-year um, facilities plan, and, I, and I'm glad Mr. Stewart does as well. Um, this motion doesn't negate the possibility of any other plans that exist. It just says that during, in our process of budget planning and preparation, we should have a 10-year facilities plan. Um, and that leaves the flexibility that Mr. Stewart was talking about. We have to have a plan, but we have all the flexibility we want in depending on how we define that plan. So that's where the flexibility comes in. It just requires that there be a plan. And that's common sense. There should be a plan that identifies our needs and our priorities. And, and again, that'll take so much of the redundancy, the re reinventing the wheel, the politics, the um, community, um, you know, fighting over funding and, and prioritization. It takes that out of it and makes the process um, clear and transparent. Okay. The community will know better what to expect. Um, and when they maybe don't get things as quickly as they would like, they can still see that it's coming up and they can see that the process is fair and it's based on need and what is logical for the system. So my comment is that uh, we have a policy review committee that has the benefit of uh, counsel, uh, that has the benefit of time and drafting, that has the benefit of public comment, um, and we're doing a disservice to our policy review committee by, by trying to, on an ad hoc basis, uh, amend policies that have come through a considered uh, review process. Mrs. Adequa, Ms. Adequa. So from my understanding, there is, it's not as if we are throwing away the idea of a 10-year plan that is on the table. What plan are you referring to? Is, that the, is it the 10-year plan? Yeah, I'm just saying that that should be in, in policy. We mm -hmm. should require one. But later on, Mr. Store, you're bringing up for the consideration of the 10 year we as a system have many long-term plans and i think alongside that we need a 10-year plan but it shouldn't be baked into a policy which is a much more rigid way of trying to direct the system okay so the motion is to amend board policy I'd three like to respond to that if i could mrs miller um so what mr stewart is going to do is basically he's going to suggest apparently a 10-year plan during our budget process um, but he doesn't want it to continue. It'll be just this time, one-time thing. We're Please all don't I'm speak saying, for me, Ms. Miller. You don't know what I'm going to do, thank you, and that's not the case. Okay, um, because you suggested that that's what you were going to bring up. Was I never said it was plan. a one-time thing for a one-year period of time. I did not say that. All right, any further discussion um, on the motion? What, what I am suggesting is to have it required in policy, which will make it a permanent thing, a permanent part of our process. So if Mr. Stewart and others think that a 10-year plan or a long-term plan is an important part of the capital budget process, then this makes it part of our process. All right, so the motion is to amend board policy 3111, which is under consideration to add a requirement for there being a 10-year plan. All in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, the motion fails for lack of majority. Back to board policy 3111, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to point out the policy review process is we do discuss it as a committee, and then we take a vote, and then we bring it forward. However, the Policy Review Committee is a subset of the board, so just because there are a certain number of folks on the PRC that agree one way or disagree one way, that does not necessarily mean that the full board feels the same way. So it's appropriate, and in that Policy Review Committee meeting, I did say that I would, in fact, be bringing this up when it came before the full board, which is to add back what was previously done up until, um, well, I don't know how recently it was done. I just know since I've been on the board for three years, it has not been done, but that we add back to policy what we used to do and what other local boards do is to have a budget committee that is staffed 
by the superintendent to support the board in working year round with the system and considering all community input. Further discussion on, on policy 3111. All in favor of policy 3111, please. That yeah. was a motion? I'm sorry. It's a motion to add back a budget committee that the superintendent will staff. That'll be year round, similar to our other committees. So, so okay. So is there a second to that motion? Second. Discussion on adding a committee assignment to uh, 3111. All in favor of Mr. Hayden. When I came back on the board, I was flabbergasted that we didn't have a budget committee. Every organization that I've been involved with, including this one when I was on it before, has a budget committee. And the fact that we don't have one just really doesn't make any good sense. So however we want to tailor it to keep whatever powers to be happy, we need a budget committee. And if this is a way of getting one, we should do it here. If not, where are we going to do it? And I think we have to have that question out there, and I think we need an answer to it. And that is a board budget committee. Okay, the motion is to amend policy 3111 as presented to us tonight to add a requirement that there be a board budget committee. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. The motion fails for lack of majority. Now we're back to board policy 311 as 3111 as presented. All in favor of policy 3111, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The motion fails for lack of a majority. I'm abstaining from that one. All right. Is there a, and a opposed? To opposed. So we had a vote in favor. We have one abstention. Opposed to 3111, please raise your hand. Three opposed. All right, next is board policy 3113. Is there a motion so to accept the recommendation? Actually, with, with respect to that la last item, uh, I would request uh, that we bring it back for consideration by the full board when appropriate. Okay. So does the whole board need to support your request or do you just get to make a request in that comment? Just like anyone else, I get to say, say things. I'm just curious how. That's just all he said was that. Um, is there a, any discussion on 3111? All in favor of policy 3111, please raise your hand. One, two, three. Uh, point of order. Uh, three, point of order, Mr. Chairman. One, I think it's 3113, which is, is the next policy. Said? Yeah. Yeah, you said th you added that extra oh. one in there. I know it was unintentional. 3113. <laughs> any discussion on 3113? Yeah. Mrs. Miller. Um, I wanted to ask, I just have a quest couple questions. Um, are there other requirements? Um, for board approval in state law and county code, um, such as um, thresholds by expenditure amount, and I guess I'm asking that of the system. So when they have to, when do they have to bring it back for board approval when there are budget transfers? I would point out the uh, board policy, uh, which tracks state law and. Council is here, and council can certainly answer as they think best. But the policy tracks state law, and if there were any budget transfers, they would have to um, have board approval prior to submission to the county executive for approval by the county council. If there was a request for supplemental funds for either operating or the capital budget, that would also require board approval prior to submission to the county council for approval. Uh, by, uh, uh, strike that, to the county executive for approval by the county council. Thank you. Are you so, you, Mr. Rocha, are you saying that for any uh, transfers or supplemental funds, it has to come before the board for approval? Absolutely. Any transfers and any request for supplemental funds. Um, it, uh, it says it's very, very precise language, and I would note that any um, changes to the policy before the board tonight. Uh, merely reflects editing convention changes. So what had been prior practice won't be altered with regard to future practice, although it will read better. 
Thank you. Further discussion on 3113. I got it correct this time. All in favor of policy 3113, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. It passes unanimously. Next is policy 3121. Is there a motion? Is there any discussion on policy 3121? Mrs. Miller. Yeah, I'm just pulling it up here. Um, can someone explain the line federal and state grant guidelines? Uh, let me see where it is. Number five. So it's it's in uh, two A five. The temptation is to say that the language speaks for itself. Federal, as in the federal government. State, as in the state of Maryland. Guidelines as to what guides those seeking federal or state funds. I will defer to council whether they have any additional information they can provide. I appreciate the mansplanation, and I agree that council should be the one to answer. And I would have to defer to staff concerning which specific guidelines were anticipated by the policy. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. Mr. Saris. So, um, Whenever uh, the school system applies for a grant, uh, we submit to the terms of that grant and the superintendent uh, signs on behalf of the system that we will, uh, by accepting these funds, uh, expend them consistent with the terms, the very specific terms of that grant. Is there typically grant guidelines with regard to budgeting? Yes, the, the grant itself uh, consists of a budget and prescribes for what specific purposes those grant dollars will be spent during the course of a year and if, uh, if that needs to change, uh, a grant amendment needs to be requested and approved by the entity, whether it be MSDE or the Department of Education and so forth. So, so they're providing us with funds and they're dictating in that grant how those funds should be spent and, and that's, what it's, Absolutely. Um, that's yes. what it's referring to. Okay, um, and let me see if I had another question. All grant budgets include indirect costs unless prohibited by the granting agency. What does that mean? So uh, there is a formula established by the federal and state government for which part of those grant funds are allocated for administrative costs. So if the grant employs uh, teachers, um, we don't have a separate payroll system for just the grant employee, grant funded employees. So a part of our administrative cost for human resources, payroll, et cetera, is, uh, is recoverable to the general fund to cover the, to offset those costs. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All in favor of policy 3121 as presented by the PRC, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, it's 10, it's unanimous. And the last policy is policy 5200. Zero, zero. Is there a motion to accept the recommendation of the PRC? So moved. Discussion? Mrs. Miller. Okay, uh, I've gotta pull it up, hang on one second. There were two uh, lines that were removed from the policy. Um, the first one is it is expected that consistent procedures for retention are employed throughout the school system. Um, can, I, can we have some explanation why that would be removed? Uh, the short answer is it has resurfaced in the draft before you, directing your attention to um, lines 33 and 34 on page one. Okay. The board expects that 
consistent procedures for retention are followed throughout BCPS. I see that. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? Uh, yes. The other one that has been removed is grade acceleration is recognized by the Board of Education as one means of meeting the needs of some students. That's been added. You're reading from line C on uh, par paragraph C on line 31. Uh, because well, that's grade the, retention. That's grade retention. She's referring to what has been deleted. Um, directing your attention to the policy analysis. It is a page that comes with this, and it's in our board docs. On line 14, it reads, staff is recommending that the policy be revised to one delete reference to grade acceleration, which was transferred to policy 6401. I will grant you that it is very poorly titled because it now reads advanced academics and gifted education. That's an incomplete title in and of itself, but notwithstanding What's that language, number? It, it's right in your analysis, on page 6401. One of policy analysis. And so is that in policy now, or is, is that pending? As we sit this evening, it is in policy and is not pending, although, as I pointed out, the title for the policy is incomplete. Thank you. Any further questions? All in favor of policy 5200 as presented to the board by the PRC, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Virch. The next on our agenda is um, uh, item O, the 2020 state capital budget. Mr. Saris is, um, oh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixon, I guess, are coming forward for that. And I think it's appropriate to start with a motion to approve the proposed FY20 state capital budget as presented in O-1. I'll make that motion um, that the board approve the FY2020 state capital budget request while adding an asterisk uh, to the footer of the request stating as follows. The order in which Delaney High School, Towson High School, and Lansdowne High School are listed above reflects the order and time in which these projects were approved. It does not reflect the order of priority assigned to each of these projects by the board. The board expects the prioritization of these and other projects to be determined hereafter with the benefit of independent, quantitative, and qualitative reports and analyses. Is there a, a second to that motion? Second. All right. Now, is there any discussion or any presentation needed by Mr. Smith or Mr. Dixit for anyone? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I would like clarification from Mr. Stewart on the reports that are that would guide the prioritization of uh, these projects. Lines 28, 29, and 30. I mean, Kathleen, can you help me understand? It's Word, right? We could use the word data. It could be a whole slew of things. I'm not sure what you're referring to. So did you have specific things in mind, or you're just saying in general that the board would, should consider those sorts of information. Sure. If I had something in mind, it would probably be capitalized or I'd specify here. This is a, a broad statement and it's just a footer. And and my understanding, consistent with I think the email we got from Mr. McDaniels, um, is that uh, this board doesn't intend the order of the three high schools that are being considered for uh, uh, construction be in the necessarily in the order that they're presented here, but instead that that order is going to be decided at some later date by both the combination of this board and others. Mrs. Miller. Is that appropriate for us to submit what is supposed to be a request based on priority order to give it to them yeah. out of priority order? I, ge I, I guess the uh, option would be to n identify them all as 28 and to have um, the next number be um, 31 just like a tie in a golf tournament. There's number one and then there's two people, three people at number two and the next person would be number five. Well, I mean, we might think that's a good idea, but we are making a
bequest of, right. of our that's why we're that's why we're putting a footnote and I think Ms. Miller there's on the one hand kind of a legal approach to submitting this document but also the practical reality that there's no funding dollars behind this yet so this asterisk wouldn't cause confusion as of yet I think if there was and your point's a valid one I'm just thinking they might reject and and just you know say well give us your priority I mean right I guess my, my suggestion is that it. there's nothing to reject here is what I was trying to share further discussion Mrs. Causey I would like to hear from Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit on what they feel the impact would be of sending the state capital request with that note we, we have provided um, footnotes as you can see at the bottom there there are four there now so it's it's not uncommon when uh, the, the state gets our request with footnotes and they'll ask whatever questions that they deem necessary and where is the IAC in their new formatting of the, how they're going to approve projects? They are still in the uh, stage of developing the process. There have been minor changes. One of the changes we saw is that instead of the October meeting that they used to have, they wanted to have a meeting uh, to explain one of the projects that included in this list, which we did. And other than that, we don't know of any changes. Which project did they ask to speak about? Any project that we, we so we, it just so happened that Pine Grove Middle School was one of the projects that is being uh, modified and it's on this list. We offered them choice of several projects and they accepted Pine Grove and we just had a meeting. This is not an acceptance of the project. This is not rejection of the pro uh, project. They just wanted to get a feel of what we are submitting. So when we submit this and the state comes to you and says, we would approve all of these projects, how do you, how do you want us to prioritize them or send down the money? Or is the reality that we have so many projects that even if every project was approved procedurally, the state wouldn't have money to give us to to these projects that are lower on the list. Well, this, this, so, so it's, what's it, sort of it, the it, real it, impact? Importantly, on the state funding request 2020, it's a zero for all three of those schools. Under every category. Okay. So that's why a footnote uh, that says we haven't identified priorities is satisfactory in my mind. Yes. Uh, it might not be satisfactory in everyone else's. We could put them all as, as I said before, we could put them all as number 28 and so there would be three number 28. And they are aware that we are in the process of a high school capacity study as well. So that, that, that is part of the discussion that Mr. Dixit has had with IAC and we have had follow-up discussions as well. So Further discussion, Mrs. Miller. I suppose that there is the risk, if you want to call it that, that then the um, state will assign prioritization on our behalf if we fail to do it. Their, their regulations require that we provide them a prioritized list. They do not. They do not assign priority. Right, but then if we don't provide it, then what happens? Yeah, but by giving them all the same priority, it is still a priority. We are providing them a priority. Well, then it could be looked at as one project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and number twenty-eight is <laughs> these three yeah. schools. But they're only going to fund whatever project that. Um, meets their criteria so I mean we could put all of them up there but they're going to only fund what both this board and the county county executive and the county council has reaffirmed that they will locally support as well yes yeah, so, I mean that's kind of my point is then they they might be able to then pick and choose for us instead of us setting because a priority we, we will be able to change the priority every year they need a list of prioritized projects every year they do not fund planning of the project for all of these three high schools we are not even requesting planning so the request is for this is planning dollars which they don't actually fund currently further discussion <coughs> mr virch thank you very much um good evening mr smith good evening and good evening mr dixit um Gentlemen, I, I look at this list and I see that our 6th District, the needs with student population growth, 
um, the families that um, see our schools as desirable places for their children to learn and grow. Um, they come to these areas. Um, I see the, a, a, a new Northeast Elementary School now that Honeygo has a, has a real name. Um, and then I look down the list, I see the addition uh, proposed uh, and that there is a study underway to establish greater details for uh, Pine Grove uh, that serves students um, in the district that I, that I represent. Um, I did want to ask you about a couple of things, and those are schools that are at the bottom down here, because they also have significant needs. Um, it's, it is good to talk about new schools. It is good to talk about the renovating of schools. But I look at Seneca Elementary School that uh, has a need for a chiller replacement. I look at our Elmwood Elementary School that uh, has a need for a boiler replacement. I look at our Chase Elementary School that has a need for a boiler um, uh, replacement. And you have taken the time in prior meetings with our board to explain how those projects ultimately are addressed. But I'm, I'm thinking more immediately of like our Orms Elementary School, where we have that roof replacement job. Um, um, Mr. Smith knows well my concern about roof replacements, uh, given Overly High School and the heavy, heavy rain that we had uh, this year. I think every time there was even a weather report of rain, I was, I was communicating with him about that. So for our uh, Seneca and for our Elmwood and our Chase uh, and our Orms Elementary School parents, if you could just, and the staff that, that, that work in these schools, if you could just very briefly for our board take us through how these, which respectfully have numbers in the 30s and the 40s, are going to be addressed. Um, I know this is just a state request. Uh, this is a state request. It has also been reviewed with county. In the past, county has funded some systemic projects based on the availability of funding. This is a continuous dialogue with county and state. So if there's an emergency need on any of these systemic projects, we just um, go ahead and forward fund these projects. Most of the times we have been able to get the forward funding for these projects. And I, I think all of us would like to get out of the emergency need. Yeah. And I know that seems to be a fallback position for us, but when you say emergency need, what does that mean? In, in February, the boiler isn't producing heat. All of, these, uh, all of these projects that you have, they are not failing, they are working. Mm -hmm. But they have uh, a higher probability of failing if we don't replace it on time. But at no time, the school will be without heat or without air conditioning because we'll be maintaining those equipment. Well, there are folks who are in an addition to, the, to our Kenwood High School, um, notwithstanding the, st the student who told me on the first day of school that she had to put on a sweatshirt in the, in the part of the school where we have the $20 million air conditioning job being done, but that the addition itself had, had faulty air conditioning on the first day of school and continues. Uh, but Mr. Smith, uh, to his credit, uh, has, has been, been, been following up on this to have this addressed. Um, what I hear you saying is it's on the list, and if I have this wrong, tell me, it's on the list because we are looking over the horizon for what we perceive to be a need to be addressed. Our preference is for it to be addressed in advance of an emergent situation. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, when Mr. Smith uh, was here last, I asked him about forward funding, the investment our county has made in our children and in the buildings where we educate them. And I asked if you might be able to take a look and see what that dollar figure is that will ultimately come back for, to us from the state of Maryland, which I believe is good for its word. But uh, when I asked if it was in the tens of millions, uh, I saw nods that, in fact, it's in the tens of millions. I heard our county executive indicate that the forward-funded dollars total $200 million. I see you nodding. Is that the accurate figure, or is there a different sum? It's in the neighborhood of $240 million from what we got from the county. Mr. Smith, thank you very much. Mr. Dixon, thank you very much. Further questions or comments? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, one thing that I wanted to point out, um, since I've been on the board for over three years, is that we have had situations in the past where we've modified the state capital request as late as December. 
So in reality, Thanks. we can, as a board, vote for this and move it forward so that you all and your teams can continue to do the work to prepare the documentation that's necessary to present to the state around these very important needs that we are trying to fulfill for our students. And that really, after the November elections, when we'll have a new county executive, uh, new makeup to the county council, and a new makeup to this board, that those individuals and entities can come together and evaluate the list and make changes at that time. So while I know where my Delaney High School in my district needs to be because of its substandard conditions, because of the number of students that are in inadequate facilities, that that needs to be a priority and we need to start planning for that immediately. Um, I will be voting for this state capital request so that you all can do your work moving forward and that as a system and um, as a community after the elections, people can come back together and, and look at the information anew. Further comments? Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I just wanted to express concerns about the lack of, of a prioritization process that the board has failed to go through. And, and a lot of that has, has to do with the promises of forward funding. Um, and I believe that those promises might be a bit more precarious, especially this year, um, as everything will be new next year. Um, I'm, I'm also concerned that those promises might be robbing our future to where we're not going to be able to get the funding that we need in future years. Um, and I just want to express those concerns. Okay, so the motion as amend the motion is to approve this state capital budget as presented in 01 with the footnote as uh, presented by Mr. Stewart. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. Sure. Sure. The order in which Delaney High School, Chelsea High School, Marystown High School are listed above reflects the order in time in which. Thank you. Here we go again. The order in which Delaney High School, Towson High School, and Lansdowne High School are listed above reflects the order in time in which these projects were approved. It does not reflect the order of priority assigned to each of these projects by the board. The board expects the prioritization of these and other projects to be determined hereafter with the benefit of independent quantitative and qualitative reports and analyses. Okay, now all in favor of O1 with the footnote just read by Mr. Stewart, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mr. Hayden, how do you vote? I'm voting no because I don't think we should put the footnote on there. It's again, it's just right. uh, more confusion to a situation as we move. Okay, forward. see, uh, we only needed six votes. It, we have eight votes because uh, the student member does not vote on these. Uh, did you have another motion now that you want to make before we do board comments? Yes. As I noted earlier this evening, I wanted to make a motion as it relates to the capital budget. I would make a motion for your consideration, board members, that the board instruct the superintendent to consider and eventually report on the creation of a multi-year prioritized capital improvement plan akin to plans from sister jurisdictions such as Anne Arundel County. That number two, the superintendent seek to engage Baltimore County government in connection with this effort and the production of its report. That number three, the capital improvement plan cover all of the capital construction for BCPS for a 10 year period of time, such plan to be reevaluated annually and updated every 10 years. Can you, I wish we had gotten this in writing in advance. Uh, can you read that again? Sure. I can also email it to you. Yes, please. So I make a motion that the board instruct the superintendent to consider and eventually report on the creation of a multi-year prioritized capital improvement plan <laughs> akin to plans from sister jurisdictions such as Anne Arundel County. That number two, the superintendent seek to engage Baltimore County government in connection with this effort and the production of its report. That number three, the capital improvement plan cover all of the capital construction for BCPS for a 10 year period of time, such plan to be re-evaluated annually and updated every 10 years. All right, is there a second to that motion? 
All right, there's a motion and a second. Discussion? Mr. Hayden. I have a problem with the word eventually. Um, that's sort of an open-ended uh, instruction. If we're going to give an instruction, when do we want an answer? Um, and I think we have to put that in things that we do rather than saying, gee, we asked for this and we never got an answer. Well, if we ask for it with a deadline on it, perhaps we'll get an answer when we expect it. All right. Other comments? Mrs. Miller. Um, Mr. Stewart, could you email that to me right now? I am trying. Um, in the first point, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you reference a multi-year capital improvement plan, but you don't specify how many years. Is that right? Mm, it did. No, it did. That's in the third point, right? I think it was in the first, but he read it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Right. So the first point is a multi-year prioritized capital improvement plan akin to plans from sister jurisdictions such as Anne Arundel County. And then the third statement, I guess, qualifies the first, but also provides more exposition for it, which is that it shall cover all capital construction for BCPS for a 10-year period of time, such plan to be reevaluated annually and updated every 10 years. Any other? And what was the second point? Second point was that the superintendent seek to engage Baltimore County government, or isn't, yeah, that the superintendent seek to engage Baltimore County government in connection with this effort and the production of its <coughs> report. Okay, so we're going to develop a plan uh, in conjunction with Baltimore County government. I think the point there is that we need Baltimore County government to, to be a part of the plan, just as Anne Arundel County government is part of their plan. So are you thinking that this is a prioritization plan, or is it more of a funding plan? I suppose the answer is whatever would be most akin to Anne Arundel County. Again, that's kind of why the qualification is there. Ms. Causey, do you have any input on and that? And Arundel is both. It's and I just sent you priority the priority and funding. It's both. Other questions or comments? Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we're discussing this. It's been uh, a long time issue that I've been uh, working on. One of the issues that or questions I have is the superintendent seeking to engage the county and government. Um, part of the issue is what I have seen on the board for the last three years is that the board has been left out until the very last minute, and usually the last minute. So I'm wondering perhaps it would be good if in your motion the board is connected at the beginning of these discussions in terms of working with our county partners. So please, I mean, elaborate. What would you propose? That we would have board involvement with the superintendent engaging, whether it's members of the building and contracts committee, going to a meeting with her, with the county executive, so that there would be the board's presence and, um, you know, affiliation with this from the beginning. Okay. So I'm not sure whether in Anne Arundel County, if they had a separate committee that did that, um, but I think that that's what's important because it's the board that has been left out. Um, one of the other things, I question that I had is your phrase about a 10-year plan, um, one of the things Anne Arundel County Public Schools did is they had an engineering company come and help along with the work that the uh, facilities and the operations folks did to outline all the needs so that every need is identified and is prioritized and then obviously you have to get the funding and work chip away at, at the whole list. Um, but that way, every community understands their needs are addressed. And then also, if there are similar needs, 
you use mass economy of scale to take care of several needs at the same time. And right. if they're identified ahead of time, that's helpful. Well, I'm not sure. Just they, to, to lump both of those points company. in together, uh, your first and second, I would say there's nothing, this is an affirmative instruction as opposed to a negative one. It's not to say you are prevented from engaging consultants or other contractors or prevented from working with board members. I don't think there's prohibitions, at least it's not. Yeah, it would seem to me that the only way to do a priority list would be to have that kind of data, so that data would have to be part of a process. Mr. Young. One thing my colleague keeps stating is the board is being left out. The board has the final say on what happens, and the board has used that say to um, modify these plans. What is appears to me is happening is that we're we're moving from the governance into the operational. Operationally, it's up to Mr. Smith and his staff to sit down with those partners and come up with what can be done. It, from a governance standpoint, it's up to us to tell them, make sure our schools are air conditioned. Make sure we have plenty of seats, both at the high school, elementary, middle school level, and they come back to us with that plan. So we're not being left out, but we have the final say. If I may add, I would think in addition, although it's fine to add language about the board should be participate, I would think that if the board wants to participate, the board could make certain that um, there's whatever the process is includes board representation. Um, I don't think there has to, I think that such motions should be skeletal and, and uh, be able to be filled in with, ac with action. Uh, further discussion? Mr. Hayden? I'd like to move an amendment to take the word uh, and, and be very specific about the time when, when we get back. Uh, and uh, I don't have a specific time, but I think it would be rather a couple of months than, than an open-ended time. So uh, just, just to leave it open. So I move that we define the specific time. When the prioritization list should be prepared? Yes. Um, okay, and it would seem to me that this is a project that would require a lot of front end rather than uh, just uh, you know, say, here's our state capital budget, we're going to use this order. It would seem to me that if we're going to do, as some of the board members around the room said, hire an engineer or a company to evaluate buildings, I know we have a facilities plan, uh, but we may use that and use that as a as a launch. I don't I don't right. know, but and Mr. Hayden, I might just add, if if you don't mind, that it is kind of a sea change moment in the way we would conduct our business, and this would be for ten years. I would agree with you of removing the word eventually. I think it's superfluous anyway, and I understand your concern there. Right. But I, I would have, I guess, some concerns at least at this moment in time in specifying a, a specific time period when the stakes are so big. So do you want? Well, the the stakes might be big. But again, this is not rocket science. This is not something that's never happened before, and we shouldn't pretend that it is. I mean, this is just let's get down to talking about it, talk with the people involved, and come up with some dates and times and move forward. We tend to make so much of a production in so many things that we do that we never get anything done. And I think we've got to try and avoid that situation. Uh, so taking eventually, yeah, and putting a proper time frame in there is a simple task. Yeah, and I would only counsel that we don't want to, we don't want to say two months if it's going to take six or eight. So we don't want to set up, a, a, you know, a, a situation where we're just going to fail in this process. So well, if it's going a to reasonable take, time, um, if it's going you know. to take six or eight. We don't have the right people working on it then. So I've been we're down gonna, these roads any number of times. But if we're going to have a level of budgets, again, to repeat myself, this is not rocket science. Right. But if we're going to have as a part of this a prioritization of the three high schools, that's not something you could decide in six weeks. Mrs. Miller. I'd just like to suggest that, um, I mean, the point is so that we could have this for next year's request. So maybe that would be the time 
okay. frame to not spe specify a number of months, but yeah. just okay. in time. And yeah. my other point, I'm a little, I can't read the email. It's not <laughs> coming up. Um, but I'm confused between point one and point three. So I would suggest that we, instead of saying multi-year in point one, to actually specify 10 year okay. in that. And I'll just, but can like I just add rolling. that, and Ms. Causey may, may know this, defendant. I believe in our conversations with Anne Arundel, it took almost 10 years from start to finish to get community input and all of that. So I, I, I don't wanna, I don't want you to think that it is just two boards decide and it's over. They, they had a robust amount of community input. So I'm, I'm not trying to change your timetable. I just wanted to let you know what we have heard from our colleagues there and how the timing it took to put theirs together. Once again, that does not mean it's gonna take hours that long or maybe it takes longer. I just wanted to let you know what they had shared with us. And to Mr. Smith's point, again, I don't, I don't think we're talking about two months or 10 years. I do think that uh, for us to have an accurate, uh, comprehensive 10-year um, plan, one that we are, again, that we are open to. We are talking about community input. We are in the midst of a, a high school capacity study. We are in the midst of a change, change in board governance, change in county council potentially, change in county executive. So two months, a couple of months to suggest that we don't have the right people around the table, I think that that is going too far. I do think that we want to make sure that we have the right people at the table, who, those who we know will be in the decision-making capacity so that we can get the data, both qualitative and quantitative data that's necessary to be included in the plan um, and to make sure that we have everybody on board. And so to Ms. Miller's point, um, perhaps, you know, again, by the start of or the, the submission of the next capital plan, I would agree, would give us adequate time as well as involve all of those state uh, and county partners that we would need. So again, it's, um, just for your consideration. Mr. Young. Mr. Smith said it took approximately 10 years for Anne Arundel County. Two, two years. Two years? Approximately two years. Two years. Two years. It, it took 10. them two years. Okay. <laughs> for two their 10-year plan. Me. I meant two years for their 10-year plan. Because two they, years they had a com plan. community engagement with Strike all of that. their communities. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Let me get that correct on the record. Approximately two years for their 10-year capital plan. Thank you. All right. Well, you just blew what I was going to say. Right. No, but, right. but it took them two years for their 10-year plan but they are smaller than us. We have, we have more elementary schools than their total school population. So looking at what they did, you know, it, as he said, it, it may be simpler or longer, but the question is, should we be benchmarking ourselves against them or equally sized districts? And I, and I said that from the standpoint of, it took them two years to get to consensus. We, we may get to consensus in a year. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying it, it just, it took them two years to get to consensus. The four groups plus the community, the five groups, it took them approximately two years to get to consensus. I'm not saying that we're going to, we may do it in shorter than that. I don't know. I just wanted to let you know based on that model, based on the. Uh, Mr. Stewart, can we have a um, friendly amendment to re to switch multi-year to 10-year and to remove the word eventual? Yes. And Ms. Eaton, do you accept that? Yes. All right, so now we have a 10-year and no eventual. But there was another, I guess, friendly amendment, which was to add uh, the time frame to be in time oh. for next so our, cycle. It, and I, it needs to, I don't think it should say aspirational, but I think all of us need to know that as we're working along, if you know, if it's really a two-year process and we give ourselves one, uh, we might be, again, setting us up for defeat. But uh, um, one year by the next capital budget, is that what the suggestion was? Yeah. Okay. Is that, a, is that accepted as a friendly amendment as well? Depends on how it's worded. If it's shall produce a 10-year capital improvement plan by the next period or shall target that date to deliver the report. So, how about shall target? So we have, so we have like a 
a certainty but a little flexibility. Okay, everyone's good with that. So now we have Mrs. Causey with something. I just think that we should thank Ms. Adekoya for pointing us in the right direction of teamwork because yeah. this is turning that, out that very calls, well. That calls for applause. <laughs> and as it happens, I have the Anne Arundel County plan. And to Mr. Smith's point, um, it did take them two years to do the um, initial planning. Um, the actual prioritization and the facilities assessment and all that took six months with MG, um, MGT. MGT. And being optimistic, if we follow, as you look through not just this, but other um, construction planning um, and taking the best practices, that it could be a shorter process. Um, and I would hope that we would look for some results in developing the process in sure. you know a couple months, hearing back from um, the conversations and collaborations that, that are ongoing. And I think that, Mr. Gillis, you had said something about board representation in those conversations. Is that something, Mr. Stewart, that you feel that you could work in? I just don't, I guess my point is, there's nothing prohibiting such a thing. I think yeah. that's the way we should work with the board. And I think, get the ball rolling and, be involved. and I do really think, really think that we should direct the superintendent what to do, and we can be involved all all along. But that's the way it should work, as Mr. Young pointed out. Do you want him to read it one more time with the changes? Okay, can you do that? I motion that the board instruct the superintendent to consider and report on the creation of a 10-year prioritized capital improvement plan akin to the plans from sister jurisdictions such as Anne Arundel County. That two, the superintendent seek to engage Baltimore County government in connection with this effort and the production of its report. That three, the capital improvement plan cover all of the capital construction for BCPS for a 10-year period of time. Such plan to be reevaluated annually and updated every 10 years and that for the superintendent shall target the delivery of this report by next year's capital budget process. All right, we're ready for a vote. Question, Mr. Hayden. Is updated every 10 years a redundancy since we, we said we we're gonna look at it every year? I think it captures the notion that the initial kickoff process may well take a year, year and a half, and that it's to be reevaluated, but the full-fledged pouring all the resources into this, re-engaging a new consultant, that would be a less annual activity at the very least. I, w I would say that the updating is gonna be done annually. Right. Yeah, I think it's confusing there. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, oh. Re-evaluated and updated annually. annually. It's updated annually because the submission of the right. annual state report. So the, the CIP gets submitted annually. So that, that's your annual one-year update about what you approve that specific year for the 10-year period that's laid out. So I hope that maybe clarifies a little bit. And, so, and one more thing on that is really, if this is a rolling 10-year plan, um, you know, it's going to be every year. And, and it'll always be a 10-year plan. Right, so, but there's you know. some, at some point in time, too, our constituents need to trust that what we're putting out there is not going to dramatically change year in, year out. I mean, I think we have to establish some sort of foundation for them. And so if we have a motion here or a process that throws everything up in the air every year, that defeats the purpose. Right, and the idea... Shouldn't. But the idea yeah. of... Agreed. The idea of having a comprehensive third-party analysis of all the buildings should not occur every year. So the idea right. is to have it right. done less frequently. And if we want to change that in the future to five years, fine. But at least now we have knowing that it's going to be at least every 10 years. Right. I just think this wording is um, confusing here so, to say updated every... So, so why don't we say updated annually and evaluated at least every 10 years? Or... Um, I don't, I don't know how okay. you want to say it, <laughs> but, but a comprehensive, comprehensive review review. or something. Evaluated comprehensively saying. at least comprehensive every 10 years. Comprehensive review every 10 years. Okay. At least every 10 years. Okay. So are we ready to vote on that? Can we have a final read? Uh, let's just do number three, if you don't mind. Do you want to hear all of it? All right. So. 
that the number three, the capital improvement plan cover all of the capital construction for BCPS for a 10 year period of time, such plan to be updated annually and evaluated comprehensively at least every 10 years. Okay, all in favor of the motion made by Mr. Stewart and seconded by Mrs. Eaton, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, nine, and opposed? Oh, she can't vote on, can't of vote course on. not. That's a capital plan thing. All right, very good. It's time now for board member comments. We'll start with Mr. Hayden. I like to see good discussion. I like to see disagreement. And I like to see resolution. I think it's important that everybody get their opinions on the table and that when their table, when their opinions are put out there, that people evaluate them to decide is there a value to those comments and could it, would it, should it change my mind? And I, I think that uh, this board has got to continue to work hard on that, not that every board I've ever been associated with, uh, both in and out of education, hasn't always worked hard with that. But I think we have to be there and we have to put our efforts forward because the kids are the bottom line and that's what we're all about. And if we don't keep that forefront in our minds, we're going to fail and what's worse, we're going to fail our kids. Mrs. Miller. I have no comments. Mrs. Hay Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd first like to welcome back all of our students, teachers and administrators. Your energy and enthusiasm this first week right out of the gate have been contagious and I can't wait to visit with as many of you as possible this year. I was excited to attend the opening of Honeygo Elementary, the first new school in Perry Hall in 10 years. I'd like to congratulate and thank parents and staff at Honeygo, especially Principal Charlene Benke and PTO President Nitsa Zadera for their dedication and hard work, and most importantly, the love and commitment they've demonstrated already in building a fabulous new Honeygo community. I was also honored to attend Governor Hogan's announcement of the creation of the new Office of Education Accountability and would like to congratulate its new director, Valerie Radomsky, whose first day is tomorrow. With the establishment of this new office, a new anonymous online reporting system has been launched to report concerns of fraud, abuse, waste, and unethical conduct for investigation. To file a report, anyone may go to maryland.gov and in the search enter school survey form. Another highlight of the week was attending back to school night at my daughter's school, Perry Hall Middle. Last year, Principal Lisa Perry and her team launched a great new format for the night, allowing for informal interactions between parents and staff and greater flexibility for parents to visit student classes. I was excited to see this format return for a second year. This is just one of many innovative ideas the team at Perry Hall Middle has implemented to manage the challenges of a huge student population, and I appreciate their creativity and initiative. This week I also visited Joppa View Elementary at the request of the community to observe both busing issues as well as car traffic issues on Honeygo Boulevard. While Joppa View wasn't alone with a somewhat rocky start to the year in terms of busing, they certainly had more than their share of issues this first week. I've spoken with many in the community about concerns regarding transportation and have asked that these concerns be added to the agenda of our next board meeting so that the community can receive updates on such topics as bus capacity, driver recruitment and retention, bus assignments, driver training, communication plans, roles and responsibilities of transportation office versus school staff, and routing. As a board, we need to understand what resources we need to provide to our hardworking drivers and transportation staff to iron out the many issues we see year after year. Our students and drivers' safety rely on our actions. And while I was pleased to hear from Mrs. White that calls have declined over last year, there is still significant room for improvement. Last but not least, I was happy to tour Towson High School with community members and county and state government funding partners. I am pleased that this board has supported the inclusion of a new Towson High in the FY 2020 state capital request and look forward to next steps to advance planning of a new Towson High, which must include abundant opportunities for community input and involvement. Thank Mrs. Kazi. 
Thank you. Just going back to the beginning of the meeting when we said the Pledge of Allegiance and looking at the flag on this particular day, it is important to remember the history and the losses suffered by individuals, families, organizations, and our country as a whole. We need to appreciate especially the first responders, both the professionals as well as the ordinary folks who did extraordinary things that day to help others, strangers in many cases. Even Canada, our neighbor to the north, in accepting flights that we sent there because our government did not want them to land until they had control of the situation. So it is important to remember the tragedy, but also the ways that people can and do support each other in times of great need. Similarly, when there have been school tragedies, we have trained first responders that have been heroes for our students and staff, as well as others that were not trained, but they were so dedicated to the students and their staff and their colleagues that in moments of violence have literally sacrificed all to protect their students. That dedication is also here in Baltimore County Public Schools. And I saw it firsthand when I went through the Alice train with one of the high schools in my, in my area. And while it's something that we don't want to discuss, it's tough to discuss that there could be violence in our schools. The fact is, is that it is occurring. And so we cannot predict where it's going to happen, we, so we must prepare. And the training that's taking place in the schools just shows me once again how fortunate and blessed we are to have these folks that are willing to have these tough conversations, to spend the extra time, and then even after the training, going back to their classrooms, their hallways, their departments, and talking to each other about how could we do this, how could we do that. It's a great program, and there's a lot of information that uh, the interim superintendent has had the schools presenting at back to school nights, and there's also information on our website. Uh, but basically, it does empower the schools with the administrators and the staff to make decisions in real time to do the best that they can to help protect the students and themselves. Um, I just wanted to move on from there that in addition to doing the training, there's a lot of um, other school visits that I did. I went to um, through uh, peek at your seat, early entry day, uh, back to school nights and uh, first day visits, I was able to get to a number of my schools, including Pot Spring Elementary School, Cockeysville Middle, Ridgely Middle, Lock Raven High School, got there for early entry day and the first day. Um, very exciting to see all the buses pull up, the energy of the students and the staff uh, working with some students who needed help identifying their buses and they controlled all of that very, very large bus loop and got every student on their bus, so that was great. Um, also, Hereford High School, early entry day and back to school night, um, and um, you know, among other schools that I was able to go to. Um, I did also get to Delaney on the first day of school when, in fact, there were no teachers there and there were no students there because of the lack of air conditioning, because of a problem that we've had that other counties in our state have solved 15 years ago. So the question isn't, can we solve this? Yes, it can be solved. How long is it gonna take? It needs to be now, this year. We should not endure a spring that we've endured this fall with students missing three days of instruction, students that needed meals, not getting meals, special <coughs> education students not receiving what's required by law under their individualized education plan. So that was very, very concerning to me. Um, and we can solve it and we need to work on that. This board and, and this administration needs to work on that. The other thing is I did go back to uh, Delaney on their first day, which was Friday. And it was great to see all the kids and the administrators and the teachers, despite still sweltering heat in the classrooms, providing great education to the students. Positive, upbeat, um, even in the midst of teacher sweating. So when I went to the school, I had the, um, I had the measure and the gym, which had students and teachers in it at the time, was 89 degrees inside the building and they're trying to provide instruction for physical education. There was a classroom that did have air conditioning. It was set to 71, but it was 78 degrees. Ironically, Delaney High School has a very excellent HVAC program, but that lab was 86 degrees with teachers and students in it. And there was another classroom up on the third floor, 93.1 degrees. 
Fortunately, there were no students in the room at the time. Had there been, that temperature would have been even higher because as we know, what has been shown is that when the students are inside the room, all of those very um, busy bodies, hot bodies, add to the temperature of the room. This is utterly unacceptable. It can be solved. It's just a matter of priority. It's just a matter of us agreeing that it needs to get done. There are temporary solutions. Every other county in this state has taken care of it. So I will be bringing this up again and again until we get this settled. Um, additionally, uh, in the last uh, week or so, other educational activities. I was also honored to go to Annapolis to hear the governor's announcement, as you just heard Julie Hen talk about. So there is another avenue for students, parents, teachers, staff, um, and even board members to go where they feel uh, issues are not gonna be addressed. Also, I had the opportunity to meet with education leaders and state agencies and workforce development folks from all, all across the state at the P20 Leadership Council, where we discuss issues uh, that connect education to expanding and aligning the workforce to the expanding Maryland economy and discussing what policies uh, might be important to present to the legislature. So I'm very pleased overall with the work that we've done tonight, especially regarding the 10-year plan, and I appreciate uh, my fellow board member, Mr. Stewart, bringing that to us so we could all discuss it. I appreciate the teamwork that we had, and I look forward to us developing that strategic comprehensive uh, facility plan that will enable us to show our communities we are addressing all of the needs and to also show our funding partners that we have needs. And if there's a way that we can get additional funds that we as a board need to advocate for that. Uh, and talking of our funding partners, the elections on November 6 are vital. Education is impacted at every level, state, local, and the board level. Um, and it's important for every citizen, every teacher, every parent to get involved. League of Women Voters has a website, 411, vote411.org, where you can go and explore the, uh, explore the elections at every level. Um, also, I wanna talk about just one last issue that I'm very, very concerned about. Uh, I have not received answers to my questions that I've presented uh, to the board chair and staff on uh, going back to August 10th around purging of ethical financial disclosure forms by the Office of Law. 2,400 forms in the February timeframe uh, were, were purged, as well as 300 additional ones in the beginning of August. It's very concerning, while at many levels, this board was engaged in vigorous discussion about what the scope of an external audit would include. And when we did agree to do one in May, it included the year 2012. Well, meanwhile, documents were shredded before and after that were in that 2012 and 2013 timeframe. So I am counting on getting more answers about this issue, but we as a board need to rebuild trust with the public and it needs to be by being accountable and transparent and when board documents are purged unbeknownst to the board that's an issue so i'm hoping that we can get answers and do better and understand what is happening thank you mr stewart <clears throat> So I do want to pick up where Ms. Causey left off. I want to talk to our teachers and our administrators, our staff. Uh, as many of you know, recently this board at the direction of Ms. Miller passed a directive which was as follows, and I quote, to immediately cease and desist in the routine or non-routine destruction of any and all school system documents and records until the conclusion of the external procurement audit and until further direction by the board with regard to record retention. That's an important caveat, until further direction by the board with regard to record retention. We should have seen this coming, but it turns out that this was a very broad policy, too broad. And I want to say to our teachers and our staff and our administrators that we have received your emails and your calls and your letters. We have been in our schools, we have talked to you, we have heard you. Indeed, there are those of us who believe that this directive needs to be clarified. I, for instance, believe at the very least that we need to clarify this directive and that it does not cover the ordinary deletion of emails, which are backed up on our backup servers. It doesn't have to be that hard. We can agree to this through a quick vote. That'd be a start. It's at least something, even as we receive answers that we're demanding going forward. 
Unfortunately, there are those who are unwilling to provide you with that clarification. You can probably figure out who this is. So I want you to remember this. We need your help. Keep us accountable. Keep us accountable as you are forced to continue to save each of your email emails until your mailbox becomes untenable. Keep us accountable when you can barely navigate through more and more and more of your files. Keep us accountable as things grow worse and the operation of our schools become more and more challenging. We want to hear from you. Whether that's calls, emails, or just your vote in this upcoming election, keep us accountable for this. It's still about you and still about the instruction of our kids. That has to be our utmost priority. Ms. Adekoya. I would like to provide one more reminder of teamwork. We are growing horizontally rather than vertically. We no longer want to work together, but rather want our own personal agendas accomplished. If it is a board involvement or public outlook that will allow for us to work together and grow horizontally, so be it. Truth be told, our foundation needs breaking down and remolding. I truly believe before we rebuild trust with the public, we must trust and rebuild our own trust within ourselves. We no longer want to work together, but rather want our own personal agendas to be accomplished. We want, when we grow horizontally, we waste our time on nitpicking and subliminally throwing each other under the bus. But how does this change? We gain full understanding of our own positions. We work together. Understandable, there will be gaps for political inputs, economical inputs, but the students. We have the energy, innovation, and the resources. And if we don't have it, we know how to get this resources in the 21st century age. What if we refuse to be set apart by our individual LAT and our individual outlooks and perspectives, but to work together as a team to collectively do our best by working as a system and accomplishing our efforts? This system has done great work, but we can do phenomenal work by working together. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Well said. Um, I would um, offer a few things. First, thanks to my colleagues for supporting a contract which will help transport our homeless students uh, pursuant to the federal requirement without the federal dollars um, for uh, these students to have stable educational placements. It is the right thing for us to do, and I'm glad that we um, work together to get that accomplished. I also want to thank uh, Ed for the good news about the board analyst position. As you heard me uh, go off the deep end about it earlier, I was very pleased that uh, that that is now going to be realized and that will be a, a true benefit to our board. Um, prior to uh, the start of school, I was able to uh, go to two of our schools uh, for sneak a peeks. One was Glenmar. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a neat event and also had a block party outside. Uh, the public library participated. There were a number of local vendors that came. It was really well done. I was also able to go to Jeffrey Hogan's um, um, school, Elmwood uh, Elementary, which is also in our six district district for a sneak a peek. It was a fun event. Uh, there were a lot of good things happening in the elementary schools in our system as well as other schools. If we give people reasons to stay in our neighborhoods and our communities, they will stay and schools are big reasons for them and their families to remain. Uh, opening day, you heard me say opening day like it's a baseball game. The first day of school, um, uh, Charlene Benke was throwing all the right pitches at uh, Honey Go uh, and it's cool. Uh, uh, when she's in a classroom, she says, we're at Honey Go and what do we say? We are on the run, which is a play on Honey Go Run. Uh, what a neat, neat school, just up the road from where Barbara and I uh, live in Perry Hall. Um, from there, it was over to Honeygo, uh, or rather over to uh, uh, Victory Villa Elementary School, another new school opening um, in um, uh, a community in my district, a school I attended when I was, of all things, annexed for a year from Hawthorne, my home school, because there was no room for the third graders at Hawthorne because of, of enrollments. But it was good to go back to Marge Roberts and her staff and to see the elements from the prior school that have been incorporated in design for the new school. It is really, really neat there. And um, there are a lot of good things that are to come from there. And because of that new school, the investment we have made and our, 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 our elected officials have made, there will be people who will stay in that neighborhood, which will be a good thing. Um, I started off that day, actually, at our Rosedale Center. I'm embarrassed to say I had not been to the alternate school, um, the Rosedale Center, when it was at the former Rosedale 
elementary school, which became the Rosedale Center. And then when Victory Villa had to, you know, relocate someplace, they went there. And then the Rosedale Center then moved to Flex Space at the intersection of the Beltway and Philadelphia Road. And Paul Martin, a former Kenwood principal, took me around and to see the things that are being done there, although I have to say, uh, having been to uh, now uh, a number of our alternative schools, um, we, uh, I believe we need additional human inputs in these facilities to do the good work and to give us the, the options for our, our kids who in the traditional placements aren't excelling for whatever the reason might be. But I, I say that as just one of 12 folks on our board. Um, and then from there, it was to Hawthorne. You've heard me say I was at Hawthorne. I extended an invitation, although I'm not the principal. Um, Dewan Pinamonte took me around. And um, um, there are a lot of good things going on there. And one thing that is going on that is, that is really good there is the Judy Center. And they have really neat pens if you go to the Judy Center at our Hawthorne. But more importantly, the work that they do in identifying children uh, that uh, need um, uh, some extra resources so that they will be able to come to school school ready and that then means that they will be on their way when they come into our schools and the Judy Center folks track uh, uh, these children um, and they may move around but if we can keep track of them then we can make sure we have the resources for them and uh, it still is a great credit to the memory of Steny Hoyer's late spouse for whom the center is of course named and as you heard I was also at our Kenwood and while the air conditioning there was really uh, blasting and as I said earlier someone had to put on a sweatshirt um, uh, the addition has its issues and Mr. Smith is appropriately working on it and speaking of Kenwood uh, tomorrow at uh, Brian Powell's Kenwood there will be a financial aid and uh, college search night. So if uh, you have a Kenwood student and are interested in financial aid, learning about it and uh, searching a college, that's the place to be. And of course on 918 and 924, the second round of our high school capacity study will uh, be uh, stopping in at Newtown and then on the 24th at our Eastern Christine Anderson's school. And I'm happy for Valerie Radomski, having represented her grandmother, having represented her granduncle, <laughs> and having been in Boy Scouts with her two uncles. Um, I'm sure she'll do well for us. Um, with that note, um, I wish you all a good two weeks to our next board meeting. Thank you. Ms. Eaton. I'm good. Mr. Young. Being probably the last thing between um, just closing out the meeting I'm gonna make this really quick to Miss Adekoya thank you um, your words tonight your words and presence at our curriculum committee meeting are truly um, inspirational and well thought out and appreciated so thank you I remind all of the board members to sign the uh, orders over on the side table our next meeting is September 25 we're adjourned that's the story I want to tell you oh.